Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting for April 18th, 2013. I almost forgot the year. I'm sorry. Um, before I open up for public comment, I think it's appropriate that if we just take a moment to reflect in silence uh, about the relative to the uh, bombings that occurred in Boston, uh, the capital of our state. And if you'll please join me in just a few moments, devoting some time to thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Murphy has a droid. Um, <laughs> the, the what? Uh, we, we, before we convene the meeting, we, uh, we uh, offer the public an opportunity to come speak with the council. Not speak with the council, but speak to the council. The council is precluded from speaking with people when they come to address us. Uh, we, the, your time is limited to three minutes, so please conform to that. Uh, uh, and we ask, and the only other thing that we ask is that when you come up, state your name and address, please. Uh, first up on the sign up list, I have uh, Rachel Clifford. She's here. She's, okay, we'll, 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 we'll go get back to her. John Andrulis, would you like to come up? John Andrulis, 46 Haydenville Road in Leeds. Two issues. One is the override. We had an override for $2 million in 2009, if I've got my figures right. Another one now for $2.5 million. We have a proposed driveway tax, of all things. Uh, taxes are just getting out of hand here. You people are just not controlling expenditures. I know it's difficult, but that's why we elected you, to control expenditures, not to tax us to death. Briefly, I am a senior citizen. I live on Social Security and the paltry interest that remains from my retirement nest egg after the 2008 stock market crash. Uh, plus, we have a house that my wife and her sister inherited down on Con Street. We rent it out. The taxes on that house have gone up over 50% since 2004 when we inherited it. 50% increase in taxes. That is basically absorbing almost all of the net income before taxes from that property. You know, we can't really come up with more money uh, because Social Security just will not give me more money to pay taxes to you guys. Well, for you guys to spend, I should say, for the city. Okay, second issue, the trail in Leeds. I learned about five minutes ago that there was a forum last night, one of the well-kept secrets of our city government. Um, I was not made aware of it in any way. It was not in the paper, I'm quite sure. However, that trail has been used for decades, before it was paved over, before it was asphalted, by citizens of Leeds, primarily citizens of Leeds, as well as some of Haydenville. It was a nice, bucolic, pastoral, rural trail where you could walk and enjoy it. Part of it still is. The other part is asphalt with racing bicycles, shouting, on your right, on your left. Um, you can't really walk there anymore. And it used to be a big door walking area, and now they've been kind of pushed off to the periphery. So what? It, it, you've taken away the rights, or you are in the process of taking away the rights or the privileges, however you want to put it, of one group of people, most of whom happen to be citizens who've been walking their dogs or walking themselves out there for, as I said, decades, over 30 years in my case, and giving it to bike riders who live who knows where, most some local Many not local, many drive up to unload their bikes. Also, along the trail, there has been a big increase in trash ever since you had part of it paved. Uh, big increase. I mean, just people walking in, not all bike riders, dumping the trash all over, leaving it there. Uh, just the increase in traffic has brought this about. Uh, and I'll give you seven seconds. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Andrulis. Uh, Andrew Church, please. Mayor and City Councilors, nice to see you all. I prefer to watch you from home. 
Okay, <clears throat> I know that you're considering an override for a special election, and I want to give you some information. I own a private residence and a few rental properties in Florence. I went back to 2005. 2005, the property tax on all the properties were $11,056.65. For 2000, it appears the total will be just under 20000 $19,628, though I haven't received the second half tax bill yet. Water and sewer for the rentals in 2005 were $22.51. In 2012, that figure was $47.89.90, and that was after many water saving devices were added. This added $2,538, and they're going up again this year. My point is that we would have to raise each rent just to keep pace with the tax increases by $720 per year since 2005. Water and sewer has more than doubled. We have not been able to keep pace or even come close. If we raise the rents this much, we would lose some really nice people as tenants. <coughs> Now you're looking for another two and a half million in tax override after six overrides in the past 12 years. I feel that you want too much. I personally would like to see the city run some clinics to address what level of service people are willing to pay for and tie dollar amounts to each level of service. According to the government data, the average salary for jobs in Northampton is $33,996, yet the city employs 650 people with jobs ranging from $34,000 to $145,700. There has to be some fat we can trim here. You need to curb spending in Northampton and help the residents make ends meet for our citizens. Please do not support another override. Every time you move to balance your budget, you're breaking our budgets. Enough already. Thanks for listening. Thank you. One thing I want to add. I talked with the mayor about this recommendation for the two and a half million. That's not two and a half million one time for three or four years as you were thinking. It's two and a half million that it adds every year for perpetuity. And I think that that needs to be clear to the, to the voting people because I'm glad I asked the question or I wouldn't know. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Um, did, uh, Rachel Clifford show up? Rachel? Hi, and can you just, uh, your name and your address, please. All right, um, my name is Rachel Clifford, and can you hear me? You don't need to lean into it. All right, um, and I go to Hampshire College. Um, on March 31st, Northampton police officers assaulted and pepper sprayed 26-year-old Jonas Correa, an Amherst resident and a person of color who had been exercising his First Amendment right by filming the officers as they responded to an unrelated call outside of Tully's. Jonas has been spuriously charged with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. He is facing not only two and a half years in prison, but also, if convicted, a lifetime of being rendered permanently ineligible to receive his full citizen rights, courtesy of what scholar and activist Michelle Alexander has coined the new Jim Crow. Such is the system of mass incarceration in the United States that, if convicted, even when Jonas is released, he would not be able to vote he would find it very difficult, if not impossible, to find employment, and he would not be able to receive public assistance, if needed. He, like others similarly treated, might end up back in prison. This case is representative of so many abuses through the prison industrial complex and the war on whistleblowers and journalists, through the lack of police accountability both here and in other nations, and through, institu and through institutional racism. This Saturday at noon, the recently formed coalition Justice for Jonas, including members of the local branch of the NAACP and several other established groups throughout the Valley and individual concerned citizens, will assemble at Bridge Street School, march to, the, march to the Northampton Police Department, and end with a rally in front of City Hall, 
to peacefully protest the staggering injustice. I urge you as members of this council and as individual members of our, of our community, as well as the viewing public to join us in support of our call for justice for Jonas, including holding the NPD accountable for its assaultive treatment of him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have to confess, I cannot read this next name. I'm going to def defer to Mary. Can you? Joanne? Oh, Yvonne. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> 159 well, Jackson Street. Thank you. I also have two things like the other gentleman, and they're exactly the same. But first of all, I want to thank the city of Northampton for educating my children in the most wonderful way. Luckily, the last one graduated in 1979 before the Proposition 2 and a half. Since Proposition 2 and a half, I think some of the citizens think that inflation happens only in their budget, but not in the city budget. And unfortunately, it happens all over the place. So I am for the override because I want the education to be just as good as the one that my children received with art and music and everything that goes with it. The second thing I'm here for is to support the um, grant and loan application to repair the bridge over the uh, Broadside, Broadbrook, anyway, the Arch Bridge up in Leeds and to extend the bike pass. It's just a very small, uh, small direction it's going. I think it's, it's less than a mile, but anything we can do, it would be really, really very nice because I enjoy walking there. They seem to talk about the, some of those sections if they're really idyllic in the old days. The pass that has not been redone has roots, you wouldn't believe it has wet spots, you wouldn't believe it. So I'm all for, I, I don't bike anymore, but I'm all for us walkers having a little better access to things. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Keith Davis. <coughs> My name is Keith Davis, 82 Stone Ridge Drive in Florence. I'm here to talk in favor of the override I believe that the um, 15 teachers that are proposed to be cut are essential services, and we cannot lose these essential services. The uh, superintendent has said these are some of the highest quality teachers we have, and if we don't offer them full-time employment now, we're going to lose them before next year. My daughters both have gone to the high school. My older one is an art major at Northeastern, in large part because of the uh, theater and art and music influences she had in high school. My younger one also is in the music and theater programs, and I attribute her academic success, both of them, to their involvement in the arts and theater and music as a way to inspire them to go to school, to enjoy school, as a way to uh, release tension from all of the academic focus. Now, I don't like the override more than anyone else, or the way that we're funding essential services, but what are the choices? I don't think that the city is frivolously spending our tax money. You've cut to the bone essential services and the cuts to the school system go into the bone. We have no choice. To the people who are fighting the override, I have a lot of understanding, respect, and sympathy, but there is no other choice. I think we all have to get really upset at our state and federal government for not implementing a fair tax policy a progressive tax policy. There are a lot of wealthy people and corporations in this country that are getting away with murder. They are not being taxed properly. Uh, corporations are criticizing our educational system, saying that students are not ready or not educated properly to go into their corporations. Well, they got to pay some taxes to prepare their our kids in school properly to meet their requirements. 
So let's get angry at the right people, the state and the federal government. We have to have a progressive tax policy. There's plenty of money. Profits are at an all-time high. Income in distribution is, is really getting out of hand. Corporate profits are up. Pressure the federal and state government to provide their um, uh, revenue to our towns and cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? That's the end of George. Well, uh, George first. We'll go hats first. He had his hand up first. So. I'm sorry, it's not George. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jean LaFrance. I live at 310 Coles Meadow Road here in the city. Been uh, pretty much a lifelong resident and a retired. 30-year veteran of the North Hampton Police Department. So I have pretty damn good understanding of administration and the responsibilities that go with it. I'm not in favor of this override. In the last 20 years, I've seen my taxes go up from $2,000 to 4500 I've seen my expenses with the city of Northampton, the health program, go up from $700 a year to $3,500 a year. My idea of this tax override is something akin to taxation without representation. And if I recall my history correctly, over 200 years ago, people in this country fought a revolution against that. And when I say taxation without representation, if every property owner was just allowed to vote on an override, that would be something else. But every eligible voter will be allowed to vote for this override. And many of them don't own a dollar's worth of property and don't pay one cent worth of property taxes. And when you talk about the wisdom involved and the discretion involved in the city expenditure, let me just call to your attention, all you respected members of the council. Within the last couple of years, the city has spent several million dollars to buy conservation land, land that is absolutely worthless. Just recently, a couple of weeks ago, they spent $484,000 to buy less than 80 acres right behind my house. My math is correct. You worried about cutting teacher salaries, police officers. $484,000 represents 10 of those salaries. So let's get away with all this BS and clarify the point this is $2,500,000, not for one year, but forever. And I think enough is enough. And this, this idea of entitlements to everybody has got to come to an end in some realistic application in operating within our budget must be a priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gene. I appreciate that. Um, Yes. Good evening. My name is Delia Martinez, and I own a property here on Elm Street. Um, my children, my three children, went to the public schools here. Um, and even though I remember my son having a biology book, you know, an AP biology class that was published the day he was born, he still got a five in his AP exam. So it wasn't the books, it wasn't the nice blackboards they had in front of them. It wasn't, you know, how warm the room was. It was because he had some good teachers. And um, at home he was taught a lot of discipline and respect, and they all graduated from college with multiple degrees and they're doing very well. So I understand about the first thing that comes out when 
they ask for an increase in property taxes is we need to give more money to the schools. But also, I raised three kids and educated them really well with marketable skills, and I had to budget. No one gave me anything. I had to work all my life. I'm retired now, but I worked all my life. No one gave me any money because I spent $1,000 in heat one month. You know, I had to budget for things. And I know that it's really easy to say, well, you know, if we need money, let's ask the property owners. You know, I believe that I was responsible. I paid my property taxes, and I like the taxes to be used in something that really is going to help everyone, from the person that is, you know, 30 years old to someone that is 66 years old that worked all their life. Um, the problem with having this voting is that it's not us that pay property taxes, the ones that are voting. This is a college town. Anyone that is over 21 or 18 that has done the paperwork is going to go out and vote for something. And there's household people that there's only one person in a household of four or five working, and the other adults or other people are not working. You know, people that do not pay property taxes and do not own property and is, are responsible of paying property taxes should not be voting for it, for that. You know, I'm not talking about voting for a president or a governor or a major. I'm talking about people that have been responsible, they have budgeted themselves, and they have paid all their taxes. But all these people that do not pay taxes they should not be paying, you know, voting for things. Because then they say, oh, everybody voted. Well, everybody can do a campaign. But that's not, that's not right. It's not right that we have to allow the city to not have a budget and that whenever something goes wrong, well, let's have the people that own <coughs> properties pay more taxes. That's just not fair. It's, it's something that... Um, should not be done because my health insurance went up, my children's dental, I had to pay for it. Um, you know, the homeowner's insurance and life insurance and everything else that each one of you and I have, we have to pay for it. So we have to budget for it. I'm sorry, the, you, your three minutes has lapsed and we'll let you run another minute or so over and, and, I, and I, I, we, I think your point has been well made, so thank you so much, appreciate it. Is there anyone else would like to speak at this time? Well, with that, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll to convene to determine a quorum. Councilor Adams? Here. Councilor Dwight? Here. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Here. Councilor Lafarge? Present. Councilor Murphy? Here. Councilor Schwartz? Here. Councilor Stacey? Here. We do have a quorum. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, Oh, yes, and first up is the mayor. The mayor has a number of presentations to make and proclamations. So he has a pastel of things. There's an AV presentation, foam core boards, and proclamation. So, thank you. The floor is yours. Good evening, uh, honorable members of the city council. Um, I have uh, uh, one uh, proclamation to uh, deliver this evening, um, and I would like to, uh, it's entitled Arbor Day. Uh, and it is in anticipation of April 26, 2013, which is Arbor Day. Um, whereas in 1872, a special day was set aside for the planting of trees in Nebraska, which then was a treeless plain. Today, millions of communities and schools celebrate Arbor Day all over the world. And whereas trees provide endless benefits, including shade, recreation, food, and building products, wildlife habitat, oxygen production and carbon dioxide uptake, and whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, lowering our heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife, and whereas trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products, 
And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, beautify our community, and wherever they are planted, become a source of joy and serenity, now therefore I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim April 26, 2013 as Arbor Day in the city of Northampton. I urge all citizens to celebrate the day's purpose, support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands, and plant new trees for the well-being of this and future generations. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the city of Northampton. So uh, that was the one uh, scheduled communication that I had this evening. Um, there's just one more item I did want to alert you to. I was at the Senior Center uh, last evening I was with, the, uh, with actually Councillor Marianne Labarge, and the Senior Center and Council on Aging held its annual volunteer recognition uh, uh, banquet. And essentially, this is an annual event to thank the hundreds of uh, community members who volunteer their time at the Senior Center. And I was presented uh, with this, uh, with this uh, mock check uh, from the Senior Center uh, director. Um, which is representative of the uh, 14,216 hours, volunteer hours, uh, that were uh, given uh, in service at the, at the Senior Center. Um, and as part of National uh, Volunteer Month, uh, they've done a calculation around sort of the cash equivalent of those volunteer hours. And uh, the equivalent that was given to me was $381,558.78. So uh, I wanted to just show the counselors that we had received this uh, and, um, and wanted to thank all the many volunteers at the Senior Center uh, for the time that they put in uh, there uh, in support of uh, the programs that go on through the Council on Aging. So it, uh, it's Thursday night, but um, you can still cash that tomorrow morning. Thanks. <laughs> the thought has crossed my mind. <laughs> it's 2.2 on the override. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the mayor will be back. <clears throat> so now we get to the business at hand. Uh, this is the first reading on the resolution for the Northampton to establish the Northampton Cultural uh, district. <coughs> um, and well, if it would please the council, I can read the language of the resolution and I'll, I'll accept that. Uh, upon the recommendation of the Committee on Cultural and Recreation Services, a resolution, whereas the City of Northampton wishes to pursue a state authorized cultural district through enabling legislation approved uh, by the Massachusetts State Legislature and the Governor's Office, and whereas Northampton has held a public hearing about establishing a state designated or state designed cultural district. That should read designated. It should be designated. Okay. Uh, whereas the city of Northampton has created a broad and diverse partnership of stakeholders committed to cultural, cultural, community, and economic development to provide oversight of the district through the Northampton Arts Council. And whereas the Massachusetts Cultural Council will be petitioned in accordance with its guidelines and criteria to designate said cultural district. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Honorable Mayor David Narkowitz and Northampton City Council endorse the submission of an application and agree to foster the development of a cultural district. And be it further resolved, the Northampton City Council endorses the state sponsored cultural district goals, uh, attracting artists and cultural enterprises, encouraging businesses, business and job development, establishing tourist uh, destinations preserving and reusing historic buildings, enhancing property values, and fostering local cultural development, and be it further resolved that the City Economic Development Coordinator is requested to work with the Arts Council and other city agencies that could support and enhance the development of the cultural district and help represent the city within the district partnership of said cultural district, cultural district, and be it further resolved that the Northampton City Council encourages all who own property or business within the said cultural district to involve themselves and participate in the full development of the cultural district and be it further resolved that the Northampton Arts Council is the designated organization that will complete the application to the Massachusetts Cultural Council on behalf of the entire city and will forward this resolution along with other necessary documentation to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, now I would accept uh, a motion. There's a motion. Second. Second. Uh, someone from um, the Cultural and Rec Committee want to speak to this? Councilor Freeman-Dane. Uh, thank you, 
Mr. President. Uh, this is a resolution that uh, is actually required by the uh, Mass Cultural Council uh, before the, our local Arts Council can, or before actually any uh, application can be accepted for the cultural district. Um, a, a cultural district so far is simply a designation. It, uh, there's no grant money attached to it or, um, or any restrictions that uh, are provided by a piece of property being inside of it or not. Um, in fact, uh, the cultural council has, the Mass Cultural Council has suggested that um, if there is future funding uh, available for programs or services that uh, it may not even be germane about whether about how the size and configuration of the cultural district, just whether the city or municipality has a cultural district might be the only elements that are important. Um, so this, uh, so th there's really no downside to, uh, to accepting this resolution uh, and, des and having the uh, Arts Council work on a cultural district for the city. Uh, it will enhance our um, appeal as a tourist destination. It will hopefully uh, be associated with uh, programs and services run by the state that will uh, uh, help support artists and, uh, and, and cultural services here in Northampton. And uh, it also helps us keep up with the other cities and towns that are in Western Mass, which, have, which are already getting their cultural designation and making Northampton look bad. Uh, so I urge that we uh, pass this as quickly as possible so that the Arts Council can proceed. You're saying, in essence, that this is codifying something that already exists basically uh, that evolved in the course of, I mean, I think we were ahead of every other community in that respect, except that we didn't have an official designation as far as that. Uh, just to speak to that real quickly, um, the, uh, the, one of the most difficult parts of uh, this application is the uh, completion of a map, uh, which would designate the, a, a rough area of, or an area that, that would be the cultural district. And that is actually one of the, um, parts that requires the most work uh, to designate a contiguous um, map of, of, of parcels that have that relate to each other in some way. Uh, and Northampton has the advantage of already having a map for Arts Night Out, uh, which has been uh, underwritten by the um, Center for the Arts. Uh, so actually, much of that, much of the hard work is already done. Um, we also um, need to collect a lot of data relating to investment in the central business district, which will be, I think, where the cultural district will likely be focused, um, which is um, what we hope that uh, Terry uh, Masterson can, can help us with. Um, but uh, really, uh, Northampton is ahead. Uh, we already have many of these, uh, many of the features that the Cultural Council is looking for. Uh, I think it, it would be a, it's a breeze of an application for Northampton, but we, we do need a resolution to have been passed by the by the legislative body. Councilman Adams. Mr. President, do you want to, did you want a motion to, to fix the, the typo or has that been done already? Uh, no, that hasn't. I'll well, accept an amendment for the typo. The, uh, I believe the term is... Um, designed to designate it? it yeah, it's, it's state hyphen designed, it reads now. It should be state hyphen designated, and that would be a Scribner's error. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it requires an amendment. So. The second whereas? Uh, that's yeah. correct. Yep. Second whereas. Uh, Councilor Tacey. I read it as though it, it looks to me as though the the city would be designated a cultural district. Is that, or is it, is, how are you going to, I'm just curious, of the obligation that we have to designate a particular district or a certain spot in the city, to uh, designate the city as a cultural district? Do one of the proponents wish to speak to that? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, uh, like I said, the, the, this, um, this designation being offered by the state, I haven't, I haven't had heard the presentations from the cultural council representatives, but they, um, they, they're, they're really trying to, for part, for, for many communities, use it as a, as a, as a, as something to focus on, um, as a way to, to collect, uh, um, resources and to, to create a meaningful uh, place. And now Northampton really already has at least one meaningful place, uh, thus our, our, our downtown, and, and arguably two or three meaningful places, meaning downtown Florence and, and Leeds. 
uh, which might be which may at some point be eligible for another cultural district but really you do have to, it it is a designated area not this not a entire municipality and the reason for that is that it's um, that's just the way it's written number one but number two is uh, it's it has the the salubrious effect of uh, helping municipalities that aren't as um, as uh, special as Northampton uh, pull in the resources that they need to really designate an area and to make a place out of it. So particular culture? Partic no, not particular culture, particular district, district. <laughs> particular area. But uh, can I also, I'm sorry. Two police. Can I just say the last thing is that, um, like, I, like I said before, the representatives from the Cultural Council have um, hinted, right now there's no, there's no funding. There's no, there's no grants or any programs attached to this, but they've hinted that in the future, um, the funding might not be specifically for projects or businesses or, or works within the district. Just the, they could be granted to a municipality as long as the municipality has a cultural district. But it may, that, that event or program or service might take place outside of the district and would still be uh, would still be eligible as long as the municipality has a district. So the bound you do need boundaries, but they and right now because there's there's really very little financial advantage to to having this other than having the designation. Um, it might be that the financial advantage when it does when it if if and when it ever does occur, it might be irrelevant to the district boundaries. But the city at this point will have no financial obligation. Nope. Yeah. There's no, there's, there's no, there's no carrot and no stick. It's a okay. qualification for potential grants. Like we're accepting a general law in order to encompass a certain. Exactly. Okay. exactly. It's not. It's, okay. it's not. There's no, no mandated expense okay. associated with. Well, this. that's funny. Yeah. Go <laughs> figure. I know. <laughs> well, wait. I'm sure there will be, in due course. Uh, any other discussion? Um, this really requires a voice vote, and this will be the first vote, and we will do a second reading at the next meeting in May. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. It's passed the first reading. Um, I have in, uh, I'm having my hand here a, um, a petition. Um, uh, this is essentially this is from the Jackson Street School, um, and there's a very long letter associated with. It. I think you all received copies, yes. um, I, uh, and I don't know if if you're inclined to have me read it or if you would prefer you just need to acknowledge receipt of this, but uh, I can. Uh, I can sum it up. Yeah, I was going to say, is there, is, if a summary fashion, yeah. some yeah, so that I, I can viewers can understand. It's why. an appeal for um, funding for the schools. It is not actually an overt. Um, it, it, it actually lays out rather comprehensively about the challenges that we that have existed in the schools to date, and that will be present given the, the current budget, and um, is. Uh, very well drafted, and it's been signed by. Wow. Uh, we had over 50 signatures on this. So uh, I, I advise you, if you have the opportunity, to read this. And this is available as a public document for anyone else who's interested in reading the contents of this, uh, of this petition. Um, that doesn't require a vote for acceptance, though, right? It's just an acknowledgement of receipt. So. <clears throat> um, okay, and now oh, we're up to the minutes, you're right. So I'll, I'll accept the motion for the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. So we'll approve. <coughs> Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, oh, okay, and now the reports. Uh, the, we have the minutes before us for the Committee on Economic Development, Housing and Land uh, also uh, Ordinance and Appointments and SSVA. Uh, do you want to move those as a group? As a group. Yes. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, this is uh, now we're up to the appointments. This is an uh, appointments to the uh, Human Rights Commission. Um, we have uh, new appointments, and I'm going to read them, and then I'll accept your, your motions. Um, the, Gwen Agna of uh, Finn Street here in Northampton, a term to expire 20, April 2016. This is to fill a vacancy. Julio Capo Jr., 95 South Street. Uh, uh, in Northampton, term to expire 2016, filling a vacancy. Eamon uh, Crowley Edge, also of South Street, uh, term to expire April 2016, that's filling a vacancy. Tanzania Cannon Eckerly, um, also of Florence, uh, with a term to expire 2015, filling the unexpired term of VJ Prashad. Um, I'll accept a recommendation. Second. Um, so the barge is gonna and you, okay you want to speak to that okay so sure um, we did have our meeting on April 10th and we had interviewed Tazania uh, yeah, Tanzania, I believe. yeah and she does live um, in Ward 6 on Stone Ridge and I've met her for the first time and I know every one of you consulars have had all the candidates who were, I mean, not candidates, but residents who came in to be interviewed. And if you looked at those applications, they all were well qualified. We spent probably about tw maybe 15, 20 minutes with her. And it was amazing of what she can actually bring into the Human Rights Commission. So she's an excellent candidate. I know um, our Consular Paul Spector um, he could not be here tonight, but he did call the other three from the Human Rights Commission, and they all want to be on it, but they couldn't because of their work schedules. But you need to look at their applications. They're well qualified to be on the Human Rights Commission. Oh, they can be on the Human Rights Commission. They just couldn't make the meeting. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, to, right, uh, okay. Right. I'm sorry. I thought they were saying they were not going to. Okay. No. Thank you. Damn, my, my apologies. So we did a recommendation of them being um, recommended to be on the Human Rights Commission. And then as to Alex. Yeah, but that. Oh, do we do one at a time? Are we doing one, voting on one? Yeah, we're, we're okay. voting. This is the Human yes. Rights Commission. That would be the right. Part. Okay. So. Yeah, I'll just echo what okay. Councillor Barr said. We were all very uh, unanimous and enthusiastic. Uh, any other discussion on these appointments? Can we split the vote? Do you want to split the vote? Do you want to separate them all? That's your preference? Okay, certainly. So there's been a request to separate the vote, so we're going to, we're going to um, move on each one. So the first up is Gwen Agnew. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Nay. One nay. Uh, next up is Julio Capo. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Uh, any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next up, Eamon Crowley Edge. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? Nay. Uh, and then Tanzania Kenan Eckerly. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No opposition. Okay. So they are approved. Next up is the new appointment to the Northampton Housing Partnership. And this is uh, Acres. I'm sorry. Move to approve. A no second. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, discussion? You want to speak to Alex? Uh, she was able to attend our meeting. We had a lovely conversation. She's um, a realtor and uh, really wanted to figure out how to give back to Northampton and felt like it was a perfect fit to to connect her realty experience to affordable housing for, uh, to increase affordable housing for everyone in our community. And really we're fortunate to have her interest and willingness. So we all, rec we three of us recommended unanimously. Uh, this is to, um, this is to fill a vacancy with a term that uh, goes from April 2013 to April 2016. Any other discussion on the can? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay.
Okay. Uh, now comes the time when I cede the gavel over to Council Murphy as we recess the regular meeting and go into session with the Finance Committee. Council Murphy. <coughs> um, Mary, could you read the roll of finance? Council Murphy. Here. Here. Present. Here. So two financial orders tonight. They are the two from CPC that we'll see back in the in the full meeting later in the evening. So the first one um, is City Hall renovations. Now, therefore, it be ordered that ninety-five thousand dollars be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funds to the City Hall renovation and preservation project and that the grantee meets all conditions approved by the CPC, uh, the mayor and the city council, specifically that 57 is apportioned, 57,000 is apportioned from the CPC historic preservation reserve account and 38 is appropriated from the CPA budget reserve account. And uh, these are for exterior improvements to City Hall, which is a historic building. Move to refer. Second. Okay. Or move to approve. Recommend. Recommend. Or recommend. I'm sorry. Recommend. Yeah. Second. Okay. Got Discussion work. on this one. Yeah, I just have a quick. I'm, I'm interested in the the separation of fifty seven thousand and thirty eight. Shall, shall we uh, recognize? Um, yes. Our Susan Wright. Oh no no, 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 no. no gonna, Sarah no. Sarah Lavalley oh, Lavalley Sarah. from move to a staff person. <laughs> All in favor of recognizing? Aye. 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 I think that was yours, but. <laughs> So the reason for the separation on this is that the 57,000 is what's remaining in the 10% set aside for the historic preservation account. So every year the, the committee and the city council sets aside 10% for each type of project account, open space, um, affordable housing and historic preservation and this is what's remaining in, in that account. So, so the 57 would be to make up the mandated 10%. It's what's remaining of this fiscal year set aside the, the, of the 10%. And, and these are for exterior renovation? Yes. Right. That's City Hall is, is uh, qualified as a historic structure for? Yes. It's listed on the National Register, and the project was also unanimously supported by the Historic Commission. But this is not the same as the front steps, or is the front steps all part of this, the granite? I don't think so. It was different, wasn't it? No, that that I think was a capital improvements as a separate item. Um, okay. This is this is to restore and maintain the facade of the building, not okay. not fix the front doors or Just whatever. Just making sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion on this one, uh, Councilor Bush? I mean, on what we received in our packet, it actually gives you a breakdown of what this. CPA money is being used for at the $95,000. I mean, we've been waiting a long time to really look at City Hall, and I can remember our former counselor, Alex Giesland, who always kept saying, we need to go ahead and renovate that building, bring it back to its historical preservation. And we're talking about repair and replacement of damaged trim and surface materials repair of damage and missing stucco and painting of the exterior of city hall it is a national register of historic preservation so i think this is great we need we need to move on this it's been quite a while since that building was left behind any other discussion on this one uh councillor freeman Daniels. will this include the anywhere on the battlements the uh the chronolation. Yeah. It's the repair of missing and damaged stucco will extend I, to parts of those at least. I, I don't know if it's oh, the, the very top of it. Okay. The chronolation, as I recall from Councilor Giesland, is made of plywood. They're plywood. Uh, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, you could sometimes you can see through yes. the cracks and everything. It's, it's, uh, is that Councilor Giesland installed them before it was a council. Is there going to be any? I don't believe that was I'm, the application. I'm not sure if that's considered part of the trim, but that would be a, a question for central services, definitely. Other questions? Then all in favor of a positive recommendation to finance? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Great. Thank you. Um, then the next one is that $10,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Access to Housing Initiative Project and that the grantee meet the conditions approved by the CPC, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, the 10000 is appropriated from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve. And uh, would you like, I'd like Ms. LaValle to speak to this one. Well, I'd like we to get a motion, yeah. yeah. Move to recommend. Second. Got it, Sarah. All right, so this is a project that was presented by ServiceNet to fill what they see as a major funding gap. There's really no programs available at the state, regional, or local level to provide these necessary funds to get homeless people into permanent housing. And this program exists, correct? Mm -mm. Uh, it exists at a regional level, um, but it doesn't extend to security deposits. It's only first and last, and um, it's not as robust a program as they'd like it to be. Human Daniels. Why only 10,000? 10, 10,000 was the request that the CPA had. Um, committee members had the same question. Um, I, apparently, there's only so many units in Northampton that are eligible to be part of this program. So they were worried that they'd ask for too much and then end up having to return some of it. Councilor Adams? I just want to make my comment now, and I, I won't I won't say the same thing again when it gets to the full council. But I, I support this very much. Um, I think this is a really wise expenditure of money. There are people in the city who are working and are homeless, and um, it is a tremendous obstacle to some people who, who are working um, to get first, last, and security or some combination thereof and so that they can have housing. I think this is extremely valuable, and I support 100%. Thank you. Council Lavarge? Yes, um, I had a resident calling me today on my ward um, and was very concerned because he had seen this agenda in the paper and wanted to know how come our tax dollars were being paid to help people who apparently are not working. Okay, so I went through the whole thing with him, went back and forth with Peg Keller. We got that straightened out, but I think I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, it, it really, it's, it serves whoever is homeless. It could be our veterans or, or families, even families who have lost their jobs and they only get a bare minimal amount of money. This is like a pilot program. I mean, they're just not gonna go ahead and just have it easy with this. They will have um, care by caseworkers who will be watching them very carefully, guiding them, putting them into either educational programs, training. If they get jobs, so much will be coming out of their income every month to put back of that money being borrowed. It's an excellent program. I support this 100%, and I think it's the best way to go. Councilor Dwight. Um, I'd like for I can understand why there might be some confusion among the community as to why on one hand we're talking about an override and then we're dispersing money here to offset people who are clearly in need and, and to prevent homelessness. First of all, I think that's our obligation, but uh, more importantly, this is money that's actually, this the, the CPC was established, it was by the state for this, for dedicated purposes. This is. This is not money that's being deprived of the schools or any other program because it cannot be designated that way. And we frequently hear these arguments, these conflations that come up over and over again about if you're doing this, why are you cutting this? And it should be known that this is by law required to go to these projects, projects specified in the criteria of the CPC. And the community voted overwhelmingly uh, to re-up on the um, CPA when they had the opportunity at the last election. It's clearly a reflection of this community's commitment to the projects that are, that are laid out and the criteria that's laid out here. So uh, I want everyone to understand that this, the core, I understand the default corollary of this, between this and potential override and deficits, and you must know I, you have to know that that these are separate lines of funding, and that they can this money cannot be assigned 
to a teacher and it cannot be assigned to uh, reclaiming your street. So it's just, that just, I think that was important. The way it is. Yeah, it is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, please. Uh, um, I just thought I would uh, add, since I, in my other walk of life, I'm director of the Western Mass Network to end homelessness, and that, um, and just to clarify that there are no resources available for individuals who are homeless and, and struggling to prevent homelessness. That, and this fund would be exclusively for that. The regional funds, the state funds that are available are exclusively for families. And that in terms of the cost to our community, that we save an immense amount by helping to ha providing targeted funds to uh, provide housing uh, instead of the homelessness that ends up costing our community way more in health care in public service costs in so many myriad ways and this the, the bang for the buck in the, in just getting uh, folks into permanent housing is extraordinary and I think this would be a tremendous use of our CPA dollars so theoretically this I mean we're all comfortable with the fact that rents are high here and it could cost a couple thousand dollars to get from a shelter into your own apartment just because of the fact that you have rents to pay in advance and security deposits so this would get somebody out of a shelter and in and they would be able to pay the rent for these units this is right you would only provide this funding to the individual who's to able to s s sustain it but it's a really defining barrier reducer mm -hmm. so uh, Councillor Tacey yeah um, I get a lot of I get many calls on this one um, and I they likened it back to the CPA with this for the CP excuse me the Valley CDC when they wanted money for people that were in foreclosure to help them out, to bring them out of foreclosure and things such as that. But that required staffing. It required a staff person, and that was not allowed. And so that was, and the, I, I try to make that distinction, and I, I, I support this. Um, so I just want everybody to know that the calls that I got, it's not, it is not the same. I mean, I'm not going to get into a long spiel on it. ServiceNet didn't include any administration funds whatsoever in this application, so this will all be going towards the program Absolutely. cost. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So any other discussion on this one? No. Then all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Then uh, those are the two items on finance. Well, Thank you. These back to Mary and turn the gavel back to Council President. Thank you. Back to the regular order of business here. Oh, I move to adjourn finance. Second. All right. All right, there we go. I would have been trapped in two seats <laughs> yeah. at the same time. It would have been horrible. I just have a question. How does he do it? Sure. During finance, as we approve orders, we do not have to have a roll call just during the council. Right, because it's a recommendation. Right. Just and checking. By char no, that's a good, good yeah. question. Just checking. But by charter. I hate to be here at midnight and say, oh, we forgot to do this. Yeah, we're going to play a lot of catch-up roll calls. But fortunately, we're down two conferences tonight, so the roll calls will be much shorter. <laughs> um, and which brings us to the orders and the clauses, actually. <laughs> so, um, this is uh, the order that we just discussed. Uh, uh, this now will need a roll call. Right. This is upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, and you. Uh, this is the ninety-five thousand dollars to be appropriated from the CPA funding for the City Hall renovation. Second it. Discussion. I'm just saying. Sometimes I can see through the plywood and the actual top of the. You know, <laughs> no, I you hear see you. daylight between it. Like yeah. today. I'm just saying that. Right. I, I, you know, the crenellation is. Uh, it's a crenellation. Is, is, is certainly would qualify as trim, and it it it. it uh, you know, it's it needs to be. it's like having racing stripes, and but uh, I mean, clearly they're not going to repel an enemy from the rampart there. But it is it is an important distinguishing feature of our city hall. It repels pigeons. It, no, it doesn't do that. I'm afraid the pigeons are very, very comfortable with the crenellations. And it never really did house cannons or archers, did it? No, no. Councilor Giesland suggested he almost fell through the roof when he first did no, that. So. I remember that. Um, <laughs> Any other discussion? Be, uh, I'm not sure roll yet call. on the aesthetic. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. Ready to vote? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Lavar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? 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 Yes. Councilor Schw
one? Yes. Yes. Is there a reason why you can't do two on this? <laughs> um, no, other than, I mean, I, I don't know as if there's anything particularly pressing as far as it goes, and I think mm -hmm. I'd rather default to uh, the regular two readings, mm -hmm. just so that, uh, you know. Just that I'm sure our next meeting is going to be quite. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate that in concern of our next meeting probably will be uh, significant. <laughs> so, but the fact is, is that, yeah, no, I think even, even in order of expediency, I think we should favor it. Okay. okay. But thank you for the recommendation. Speaking of recommendations, this is also from the CPA. This is $10,000 appropriated from the CPA to fund access uh, to housing initiative projects. Move to approve. Second. There's a second. No further discussion. All those. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Roll call. Roll call. I'm getting better. Yes. Aye. Present. Oh. Ah. Yes. Bill. <laughs> yes. Bill. Yes. 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 It's way too early to be this punchy. I know. Great time. Um. I need another coffee. <laughs> This is second reading on the uh, FY 2013 budgetary transfers uh, from the police department. Uh, if you recall, the twenty thousand uh, dollars transferring from uh, salaries uh, the PS to OM. Second. It. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. Roll. Enjoy that. Roll, Roll call, please. <laughs> aye. Aye. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Short. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Yes. Um, this is also second reading for this. This is, um, whoops, excuse me. This is upon the recommendation from the mayor. It's $8,743 be appropriated from the FY13 general fund undesignated fund balance to the Water Street Bridge Repair. Move to approve. Your second. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> Roll call. Roll call, please. Yes. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Schwartz. Yes. Council Stacy. Yes. Council Adams. Yes. Council White. Yes. Council Freeman Dan. Hi. <coughs> uh, next up, this that's the second reading that has passed, and this is second reading also financial order. Appropriation of seven thousand dollars from the FY 2013 general fund on designated fund balance, free cash to central services repair and maintenance of buildings, for the modifications to office space in the of Veterans District. I'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Schwartz. Yes. Councilor Stacy. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniel? Aye. Councilor Labarge? Yes. And now what you've all been waiting for. Um, well, some of you have been waiting for. Mm. The, uh, this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narco. It's ordered that a special election be held in Northampton on June 25th. 2013, that the following question be placed on the ballot pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 59, 21CG. Shall the city of Northampton be allowed to assess an additional $2,500,000 in real estate and personal property taxes for the purposes of funding the operating budgets of the city and the public schools for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2013? <coughs> and it's yes or no is the voting uh, I'll accept a motion. Second. It's on the floor. Uh, the mayor is here to present. As you know, we don't need to recognize him. So if, uh, if you have no objections, we'll allow him to make his case, please. I apologize. You want us to give you some time to, ask, to should, assemble your uh, project? I should have asked for a quick moment. Um, I'll just have you one more second here. Sure. Uh, I just want to um, I have a handout that I'd like to give to the uh, members of the council. Um, and I have a uh, display board here that I'm going to put up uh, during this conversation. Sure. Budget cuts, that's why you got this little clips. It's thank you. It's a little yes. clips. Okay. Do you have extra ones for the public too, Susan, by any chance? 
way more than that. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Thanks. Um, for those viewing at home who clearly cannot see this, I'm pretty they will be able to see it because it's going to be projected by. It's going to be projected, camera. okay. But it's even, even the, oh, Mary, hi there. <laughs> Did you increase the Sorry. font? Thank you, Susan. Yeah, that was okay. Um, so, good evening, uh, members of the City Council. Uh, again, um, I wanted to uh, speak to you about the uh, proposal that I've put before you a uh, ballot uh, uh, special election on June 25th uh, for the purpose of a uh, yes or no question for raising an additional uh, $2.5 million in revenue uh, for the uh, uh, city and school operating budgets. Um, I think I've uh, outlined throughout the budget process the, uh, the issues that we're facing uh, in terms of the structural issues we have relative to uh, our ability to raise revenues, relative to the uh, rise in our expenditures, many of them fixed uh, costs uh, that rise faster than uh, the revenue that we have to be able to support them. So what I what uh, want to do tonight is to present to you a plan that we have developed for uh, using this $2.5 million override, not only to uh, address the fairly severe gap that we have in 2014 and to be able to maintain the services, the, the, uh, the services that uh, are facing cuts, um, but also map out a plan over the next uh, four fiscal years uh, to sustain those services. So um, we've tried to do it all in one sheet for you uh, so that you can uh, sort of follow uh, the, how it would work over that four-year period. The highlighted um, in yellow is obviously the most important number under discussion tonight. That would be the 2.5 million, uh, which would be added uh, if the voters accepted it um, to the levy limit, um, which would then uh, build in those additional revenues. What I would propose in fiscal year 2014, and we've broken this up into revenues and expenditures, uh, and these are all the, the familiar uh, budget lines that you see in our budget books. Um, again, property tax, local receipts, state aid, and the other financing uh, sources that we received. Um, and then on the expenditure side, the various operating budgets of the functional areas of government, our debt service and capital, our employee benefits, our insurance and reserves, our non-appropriated uses, and our state assessments. Um, so what we would propose uh, if this uh, budget, if this proposal is put on the ballot um, and accepted by the voters, that we would take uh, of the one, uh, the 2.5 million in new revenues, uh, 726,285 of it would be redirected towards city um, operating expenses. This would be largely in the area of public safety, general government, as well as uh, what I believe are important uh, investments in our, in our uh, stab capital stabilization fund, which is something that I've spoken about at our, at our budget forums and the fact that our reserves uh, have become, I would say, perilously low, uh, and we need to make a commitment to those. Uh, one million dollars of that would go to the public schools. Uh, again, the, we just adopted a budget on the school committee uh, last week, uh, which will uh, make some fairly significant cuts in the schools, uh, reductions in teachers, busing, programs, et cetera. Um, and so uh, that would restore those services uh, to the school budget. There's then a remaining balance uh, of $737,715 uh, uh, in additional revenue that would be raised in FY14. What we are proposing to do is to create an override stabilization fund. Uh, this would be like the other stabilization funds that we have. You know, we have a, a, a stabilization, we have a capital stabilization. We would create an override stabilization, which as you know is a fund that requires a a high level of transparency, it requires a high level, it requires a two-thirds vote by this council to take money out of it. Um, and we will put that money in that override stabilization fund. Then as you move over into the next uh, fiscal year in 2015, um, again, the uh, 2.5 million uh, will be incorporated into the base levy. One of the speakers in public comment mentioned the fact that, uh, that a general override is in fact, it happens in one year, um, but it is true that this base, uh, this uh, levy limit, uh, that number gets added uh, to the levy limit. So this levy limit of 47,962 
when we begin the same calculation in FY 2015, the Lemme, we start at that 47,962. So in effect, that 2.5 million has been sort of incorporated permanently into the levy limit from when we do the calculation of the two and a half and the new growth. Um, so what we're proposing then, if you look into the, into the 2015 budget, we've done a number of projections about what we believe we can expect in that fiscal year uh, in local receipts, in state aid, and in the other financial sources that we received. We've relied heavily on historical data over the last several years uh, to be able to make those projections. Um, in some cases, uh, we have some revenues uh, that uh, will be, um, uh, for example, you'll notice hotel, motel, uh, uh, local option tax. You'll see there's a somewhat significant projected increase uh, for the 2015 budget. As you know, there's a new hotel room that's a new hotel that's being built that's going to be adding over 100 rooms, which will increase our inventory of hotel rooms in the city by about 20 by 25 percent. So we've tried to factor that in that these additional rooms will be generating uh, some additional revenue. Um, but in most cases, we've looked at historical trends. Unfortunately, uh, state aid. Uh, the trends over a long period of time have been very minimal increases. Uh, in fact, decreases over 10 years. Uh, we're getting less state aid now than we were 10 years ago, and that's in actual dollars. Uh, but, we, so, but based on the trends we're looking at, again, very minimal increases. Um, other financing sources, again, these are fairly stable and easy to understand numbers that we deal with all the time in the budget. So we would be looking at an increase in revenues of about 2.54 percent. On the expenditure side, uh, we would again be trying to look at these various functional areas of government, and we've tried to look at what we believe is a level of growth in each functional area that will allow us to be able to maintain uh, level services within each budget area. And they're not equal across the board. So for example, our public schools uh, we're projecting a 3.9 percent growth pattern. Uh, they are the largest part of our budget. Uh, as we all know, they're the most uh, uh, people intense part of the budget uh, in terms of personnel and are most sensitive when we have a, a, a budget situation where we have to make cuts. It's a much larger impact. Um, you'll notice that public safety and public works, we're projecting a 3.1 uh, percent uh, growth. Again, public safety is very much people oriented. Public works is people oriented, but it also, unlike most other departments, is much more OM oriented. There's a lot more materials, uh, sand, asphalt, those kinds of things that they rely on in their budget to be able to provide. So, and then in general government, we're projecting, again, a very modest 2.75% uh, growth pattern uh, for the other areas of general government. Um, so when you come down to the bottom in that FY 2015 budget, you'll see that overall we're projecting a growth in expenditures of 2.95%, um, which, uh, uh, which, um, which will then actually leave us again with a small surplus in that particular year of 458,876, which we will again allocate to that override stabilization fund. We will put that in the override stabilization fund. And if you follow along down at the bottom, we've sort of created a chart that shows you how that fund will grow as we put the funds into it. So then you move across again to the third year of the plan. Again, we're, we're allowing for uh, the revenue projections that we think are, are reasonable. You know, we're using new growth projections uh, that are historical averages. Um, and again, using the same growth patterns on the expenditure side, uh, we will then yield in that particular uh, uh, budget year only a 58 thousand dollar surplus. Again, we're still maintaining level services, uh, working very hard to stay within that level service budget. Um, and then when we move into year four, uh, you'll see that at that point, still following that s those same trajectories, in order to then create that level service budget for FY17, we will then have to rely on uh, 1.2 million, uh, 1.276745 million of that override stabilization fund in order to provide a level service budget in that particular year, uh, which will then leave that, uh, that particular stabilization account with a balance of about 13,900. So 
<laughs> the, that's sort of the proposal. I know that when we've had these discussions about overrides, uh, that we often focus on the, the sort of the crisis at hand, and that folks often say, "Is there a plan? What's the what's the longer term plan?" Um, and again, I think we all know, as we've discussed it, uh, there is a sort of built-in structural imbalance for municipal budgets in terms of the costs that we have to uh, deal with on a year-to-year -year basis uh, that are going up at a rate much higher than our ability to raise revenue. Um, we obviously have worked very hard. Uh, uh, my administration has worked very hard to try to find savings in health insurance, uh, in other efficiencies, regionalization, et cetera. Um, but we are left now in this situation facing the gap that we're facing with this remains sort of our only local revenue option that we have, which is to ask the voters whether or not they will allow uh, city government to raise the additional revenues that are necessary in order to meet our needs, not only for the coming fiscal year, but again, over the next four fiscal years. So that's the, uh, that is the plan that I've outlined in terms of the impact of a, of a $2.5 million override, uh, the impact on the per thousand of, 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 of uh, valuation would be 79 cents. So that, that uh, per thousand uh, that we pay our, our tax rate, this would add 79 cents to that. And for the average single family home in Northampton, uh, which currently is uh, valued at $297, uh, uh, $297,323, uh, the impact on that tax bill would be $234.89 a year. That would be, again, we're talking about all the single family homes in Northampton, the average valued home is that 297. So obviously it would have a different impact depending on the value of your home. So uh, that of course is the, uh, that's the plan. I do have to say again, in terms of, uh, you know, being completely uh, sort of a little bit of a paradigm shift in terms of talking about this issue and this problem, you know, if you look again at FY 2018, you'll see that even after implementation of this plan, uh, we will then be looking at in that fifth year uh, a, a, another budget imbalance uh, between our revenues and our expenditures, uh, again, of $1.9 million. Uh, so my goal will be, obviously, and I think the goal of, of, of all city officials will be to work very hard over this period, if in fact this plan is accepted, to try to find additional savings, to try to make this last longer than the four years, uh, to try to look at, again, ways that we can increase efficiencies in city government, obviously lobbying for more local revenue, lobbying for more local option revenue that we could then uh, use to fund our budget and not be as reliant on property taxes. Um, and, and so that, that is the picture that I want to lay out for you to give the context to the request that I'm making to you to put this uh, question on the ballot before the voters on June 25th. Um, in, ter in terms of the logistics of the budget process, as you know, um, I will be required under the charter to present to you a budget, a balanced budget, at your second meeting in May, which we will do. We will present to you a balanced budget that uh, obviously, irrespective of this plan, uh, that incorporates the, uh, the uh, budget that was recently adopted by our school systems. Uh, and we will make a budget that is balanced and incorporates uh, the cuts that have been described uh, to, to basically close that gap and arrive at a balanced budget. Uh, we will do that and obviously you will work through your process of studying it and people will be able to see firsthand this is the budget that we will have uh, based on the revenues that we currently have. Um, you will, I know typically you will be asked to, to take readings on, this, uh, on, the, on the mayor's budget in the month of June. Uh, you have a meeting on the first Thursday and then the third Thursday. One of the things, depending on if you put this question on the ballot, uh, we may want to talk about is the idea of possibly delaying the second vote on the budget until after the 25th of June. Uh, so that depending on the outcome of, the, uh, of that question, we could then present revised numbers uh, for, the final, uh, for the final vote of the council. 
that's more logistical. A similar thing would have to happen uh, with the um, with the school committee as well to make revisions to their budgets. Uh, but that's the format. Obviously, we all know that Proposition Two and a Half was adopted in Massachusetts uh, in, in the 1980s and was essentially provides this as the only mechanism if we want to raise revenues locally in excess of two and a half percent that we must go out to the voters of our community and ask them to uh, give us the permission to do it. And I believe, uh, given the magnitude of the cuts, uh, that this is one of those cases where we need to bring that uh, question out to the people of Northampton uh, to help them uh, make this decision. And that's why I'm putting forward this plan uh, so that we can show a path for sustainability uh, over the next uh, four fiscal years if this uh, additional revenue is allowed. So I'll thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I can listen to the debate or answer any questions that people have. I suspect you'll have some questions. Uh, Council LaBarge first. Yeah, Mayor, just a question, please. When will we be getting our school committee budget books? The way it will work uh, under the new charter, uh, we uh, the, the schools were required to take votes on their budget 30 days prior to my needing to submit the budget. So what we will be doing is actually incorporating the school budgets into the overall budget. Uh, so you will see that it incorporated into the overall city budget that I then submit. Um, so you will have, uh, you will have that information. Uh, it will be actually part of the overall city budget. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm just gonna grab my water quick. Yep. Watergate. Watergate. <laughs> Senator Rubio. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not to the, <laughs> the Rubio Reach. Yeah. Uh -huh. Rubio Reach. And I also have a sustainable water bottle. <laughs> uh, so I have any other questions of the mayor? Uh, Councilor Freeman. Oh, he's got his hand up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then, and then you're next, Chief. Uh, thank you for this presentation, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I do have a, I have a question. It seems. Uh, could you, could you comment on the uh, growth rates of, uh, and, and revenues and the growth rates and expenditures that you're using there? I mean, to be, are these conservative? They are, they are conservative. By all means, we, we are trying, obviously, um, uh, to use numbers that are conservative. And, and particularly, <laughs> we want to be conservative, particularly on the expenditure side and the operating budgets. Uh, um, because again, we're sensitive to the size of the override, and we're sensitive to um, making sure that the taxpayers understand that you know the situation we're facing, as we've said, is 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 I I, I would assert is not about that we're overspending. It's a, it's this imbalance, this structural imbalance between the revenues that we're allowed to raise, the the state aid that has dropped off precipitously, versus things that are rising at a much faster rate. Um, you know, it's something we've been talking about. We talked about it with our state legislators recently. So, um, you know, the, the revenue projections, I mean, again, uh, you know, the two and a half is fairly straightforward. Um, the new growth numbers, obviously, I want to work. They're flat. Well, Worse they're, they're flat. flat, but this is actually a historical trend. We've had some up and we've had some down. If you look over the last five years, this is the average over that time. And now, obviously, if we're able to produce more new growth, that's great. And we're going to continue to work on that. And that's a major part of my agenda has been trying to spur economic development and expand the tax base. And if that happens, then that's to the good. And that allows us to sustain this longer. Um, but again, all we can look at today, um, you know, I could, I could say to you, we're going to have million dollar new growth next year, but it really wouldn't be based on anything other than just my optimism. Um, but these numbers are based on, on, you know, the data that we have. And can I also ask um, the charter school? Yes. Uh, under the assessment, that's a 2.6 right now for the FY14 budget, and then you've got it increasing at 6%? Uh, that's the charter school and choice sending tuition, right. um, and so that is actually a uh, that's actually a historical average. It actually is going down slightly. The assessment is going down slightly in this year, but if you look at the four-year average, it's been growing, and including that, incorporating the the current year, it's growing at a six percent clip. That's what it's growing at on average. 
Um, that's one of the charts that I showed in my <coughs> town hall budget forum, you know, where we were spending, you know, 750,000 on those uh, charges 10 years ago. We're now over two and a half million a year, and it's been on a very steady rise. Again, you know, that's one of those, in some ways, one of those issues that's a little bit out of our control based on the funding system. Uh, and that's clearly something that we can talk about working on reforms. And, and also, I would argue, uh, you know, by keeping our public school system strong and vibrant, uh, we, don't, we, we, we keep kids in our district and perhaps lose less uh, children to school choice and to charter schools, which then has the kind of uh, double-edged effect of, you know, we lose more revenue. Uh, for the kids that are behind, that are that are still in the in the in the main district, um, so again, that's one of those stark numbers, six percent. But that is a very realistic number based on the last uh, five-year average. Uh, we don't see any sign of that uh, changing, um, and so we have to factor that in. Uh, Councilor Tacy. Yeah, I don't. I don't want anybody to think I'm picking on anybody. Go ahead. I have, uh, I, have I, I have some questions, and I've asked the mayor about this uh, before. Um, things such as vehicle take-home policies and things such as that. If, we, if, if we're going to be asked to put this um, on a ballot and put it before the voters, I think it's our it's our obligation to at least show them that we have done everything that we possibly can to make this work within our budget. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But things such as vehicle take-home policy, I know that these are friends of mine too, but I have to put all that aside here. Um, things such as uh, we have pickup trucks and things such as that. We have one uh, that travels back and forth to Springfield every day, an F-350, $58,000 truck that travels back and forth to Springfield every day for, us, for an employee. We have them that go to West Hampton. We have them that go to Hatfield. We have them loads of them and it's my assertion that even if you are a department head and if you have to respond you have people on call that respond to emergencies and things such as little things that is that is stuck in people's craw about vehicles traveling back and forth to their homes and it's a, it's a huge number of calls that I get on my machine and so when I've, I've actually brought this up to you before yes you have and, and I can respond to it yeah please so uh, I, I obviously this is uh, you know one of the things um, uh, that I said when I became mayor was that I'm going to look in at, at everything everything would be on the table I would be looking really with a fresh set of eyes on on issues and uh, and this is one of those issues that that I've been looking at very closely um, you know this and comp time and cell phones and and so one of the things that we've implemented uh, uh, this year is a new uh, take-home car policy uh, that is now requi requiring uh, on an annual basis, and it will begin uh, this year, I will be evaluating, uh, e each department will have to uh, provide justification for vehicles that are being used uh, for, uh, for take-home purposes. Uh, uh, and there's a form that they will be required to fill out, and I have the final word on approving those. There's also some other uh, reporting that has to happen uh, related to the, the um, tax implications of a vehicle like that. I will say to you, however, um, uh, that in some cases, uh, some of these vehicles are contractual obligations uh, that are part of collective bargaining agreements. Um, in, in some cases, uh, public safety specifically, uh, this is a fairly uh, standard thing in terms of other communities, 24-7 uh, personnel, police chiefs, fire chiefs, uh, having these vehicles uh, as part of their job and as part of, again, as part of their contracts. So uh, I'm mindful of that, and obviously the budget that I submitted, uh, that I will be submitting to you uh, in May, uh, you know, again, reflects my efforts to try to deal with these kinds of issues. Um, and in some cases, we've uh, removed cars or t are, are planning to take cars out of service. Um, uh, and it, it is an issue, but I, I, I must say to you that uh, um, I, I don't believe that it that this one particular issue uh, contributes to the sort of the structural issues that you and I also talk about uh, on occasion. Um, but I understand the concern, the perception concern, 
Um, and again, I'm working very hard to make sure that there's accountability and transparency and that I'm reviewing those uh, issues. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, another, uh, I had asked the fire chief uh, last year when he stood before us at the budget hearing um, about what it cost to do fire suppression service for the city of Northampton. He had told me it was $3.4 million. And then I had asked about EMS, and that was $2.4 million. So, and so if our receipts for, I'm trying to, my math, help me with the math here. If it's $2.4 million for EMS and our receipts are 1.5, uh, that looks like, is that a $900,000 loss? And then out of the 1.5, we also had $500,000 in stipends, which would make it 1.4 million, which is the gap in the city of Northampton's budget right now. And I know that when the ambulance service was sold um, to the city by uh, the fire chief and the former mayor, that it would generate approximately a half a million dollars in cash to the city. And I, I, I help me with the math here. I don't see it. And I, I've asked for this. I asked for it last year, and I'm, I'm, I'm still asking. I think I've asked two or three times so far this year. Uh, will somebody please explain this to me? I know we, it, it, if this is hemorrhaging what I can see as $1.4 million a year, uh, I'm asked, but the, my question is why? And, and if, if somebody could put this in front of me in black and white, I'd be happy to look at it. I mean, it's just a question. I understand. And before anybody. And as you just know, Councillor, I am I am open to all questions. And I know you are. I, my door is always open to I questions, and I am always willing to look into things. Um, it's difficult for me to obviously tonight. Um, I'm here to talk about this ballot initiative. Uh, you know, you obviously are quoting something that the fire chief said last year, um, and you know I, I'm not prepared tonight to dissect the fire department budget. You do know that last year one of the steps I took um, was to. Uh, collapse the the, the um, receipts reserved for ambulance into the fire uh, budget so we now have a unified fire EMS budget and I and uh, and obviously that was uh, met with some concern um, by the employees um, of the of the fire department who were concerned about those changes and as expected there, and there are some uh, collective bargaining issues that I can't really discuss at this point that also play into that um, I guess what I can say to you is I will submit a budget uh, in a few weeks on May 16th uh, that will provide, uh, you know, services including the fire EMS budget. And uh, at that point, that will be open to scrutiny, open to scrutiny of, by the council and the fire, the fire chief and the fire department personnel will be here to respond to that. And we can go through that analysis. Um, and, uh, and there'll be plenty of time between now and June 25th to go through that analysis and talk that through. Um, you know, I, I firmly believe that we made a decision, not only a financial decision, but it was a service decision. It was about delivering a quality public service, uh, an ambulance service, um, while also allowing us to maintain a very, a very uh, uh, you know, high level of fire suppression. Um, at the time the decision was made, but I'm always opening to reevaluating. Uh, and certainly, when we put forth our budget to you in a few weeks, this can be one of the things that we can you can scrutinize and the council can scrutinize, and we can have a conversation about it. Um, it's just uh, tonight is I don't really feel it's that the, the, that's not really what's on the floor right now. But your point is well taken, and it and it can certainly be part of our discussion in the budget process. But but what is on the floor right now is a vote to whether or not to put this on the ballot. You are correct. And I, I think I, I think all of this plays into it. I, I don't see that I have the information to support putting this on a ballot. I mean, I have asked for this for two years, um, well, three years. Uh, but I must remind you, Councillor, that I know. you also voted for a city budget that included an EMS service. And, Absolutely, and you voted but, for it. The budget that we're yeah. currently operating under. So, and, so uh, that's the only you know that is the budget we're in right now. Um, and I can also say that even if we we do the analysis and we find that there are some changes that could be made, 
um, I think you'd have to agree that that type of a change can't be made by July 1st. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> but uh, my vote for the budget bill was not a wholesale embrace of the entire budget. I did have some questions about the line items, but I, and, I, and I made that apparent mm -hmm. during my vote. Um, so, but if this, if all of this is, if, if we say, well, this is not the time, then when is the time? If you ask last year or the year before and it doesn't come to us, when is the time? So we can't do it by July or June 25th. I understand that. So maybe we should ask 10 years ago or how, how, however long. I mean, it, it seems like we kicked the can down the road and every year we end up at this stone wall with our budget. Uh, so, and now here we are, now we're gonna ask for $2.5 million. When our budget gap is 1.4, people are asking me these questions mm -hmm. all over the city and I, from every ward. So anyway, that's, I don't feel as though I have an accurate breakdown of this, um, which is a huge piece. So I'm, I'll stop and um, I'll let, I'll yield the floor to anybody else who wants to ask. Uh, Councilor Schwartz, then Councilor LaBarge, then Councilor Fernandez. Uh, I guess I want to start by thanking you for your hard work and your leadership and your vision to bring us this proposal. I appreciate your, um, your really laying out for us and for all the voters in Northampton just what our fiscal reality is and what this override offers us beyond this moment and into our short-term, medium-term future. What we know about this moment is we have this choice uh, between maintaining critical services, our, a critical level of education in our schools that is at stake right now, and that this override, voting on this override, offers a way to preserve that critical quality of education. And at the same time, what you've done here is provided us with, uh, with uh, a solution that moves us even past that. And, um, and that really addresses our reality that we can't, until we fix the problem on a federal and state level with additional revenues, um, we are reliant on ourselves. And to be reliant on ourselves is to be reliant on the property tax, in addition to all the efficiencies that you're talking about. So I want to say thank you. Um, I also want to ask you um, whether or not you have a, um, examples from other communities who've had this sort of methodical, visionary approach to uh, this, this constraint of local communities and the fact that property tax is what needs to be relied upon for maintaining our basic services, whether you have an example of other communities who have done this kind of plan. Yeah, and, and, we, uh, and we have looked around at some other communities that have taken this approach. And again, I think the, um, I mean, even if I'm told, even if you look into the legislative language of when, uh, you know, when the Prop Two and a Half was passed and was not enacted, that you know, it was not viewed that overrides wouldn't happen. It was just that this was going to be the mechanism that that it, you know, or that that you wouldn't have the need to have overrides. It's just this was the mechanism that that you. And so, um, you know, one community that we've looked at that has that has used this similar approach is the town of Arlington, uh, which is uh, in the eastern part of the state. Um, several years ago, uh, they um, put forward a proposal like this. Uh, they put forward a five-year plan, um, and that plan uh, was accepted by the voters. The override was accepted. They actually were able to extend it an additional year. Um, what happened in the intervening time, uh, the new Health Insurance Reform Act came into effect. They were able to move their town into the GIC and find additional savings. So they actually were able to create a six-year uh, plan um, although they did recently go back to their uh, citizenry uh, um, and asked for another three-year uh, sort of renewal of, the, of a similar plan uh, using the same kinds of projections. Um, I know that Amherst uh, has, used, uh, has used that same approach of trying to show people uh, so what a, what a four- or five-year plan would look like um, and other communities as well. And again, I, I think um, you know, people have asked me about the the general override that we had in 2009, uh, and why is it that four years later, you know, we have to have another override? And I think you know, this model kind of describes it in some some ways. But you know, in 2009, um, we were at a level uh, where even the two million dollar override didn't bring us back to a level funded budget that year. We still cut our budget um, in 2010 uh, because, of course, it was a six million dollar gap. Uh, we had lost two million in state aid, and so. 
over the, we sort of started out in a hole even in 2010 and essentially have uh, 11, 12, 13, uh, we've been cutting uh, to, 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 to be able to, um, you know, to, to, to have a, a balanced budget. Uh, and so, and again, I remind you to go back and look at the 13 budget where we did have to make some significant cuts uh, on the school side and the city side in order to, um, in order to balance our budget. And so here we are again, you know, 2014, and we have this gap. And again, it's about that separation between expenditures and revenues. Uh, and I would submit that, you know, the, the, what we're looking at in terms of um, you know, growth in areas like general government 2.75% uh, is, is very conservative, uh, uh, moderate, um, and not by any, and it's going to be, we're going to have to work really hard to stay within that, uh, but I believe that that's a realistic approach. Uh, if, if, in fact, citizens want the services uh, that, 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 that I've been hearing from them, that they want to have a voice in trying to maintain. Uh, Council of the Barge. <coughs> And oh, actually, well, you well, throw me on the end. Go oh, ahead. Are you fine? Oh, yeah, I'll be okay. All right. Then oh, Councilor Jamie right. Daniels, then Councilor Murphy, then Councilor Tacey, then Councilor Adams. Actually, uh, my concern is Councilor Murphy and Councilor Adams have not asked questions yet. Let I, them go. If you'd be all right. If you That's fine. Yeah, so Councilor Murphy first, then Councilor Adams, mm -hmm. and then we'll start the order. Right? Irish rules. That's yeah. fine. Well, it's actually our rules, is too. <laughs> yeah, I don't want Jessica to Well, I mean, um, and. You know, I've, I've said this before at every opportunity I get to say it, that we're just not an economically viable entity. And no municipality in Massachusetts is based on the constraints of Proposition 2 and a half, because when you come right down to it, the only way that we can get more money is by increasing our property taxes with an override. And less than half the voters in Northampton actually pay property taxes. So, you know, talk about something that's a tad aggressive, 50 percent of fewer than 50 percent of the people are the ones that actually pay this. And Mr. Andrulis was correct when he said you can't dollar for dollar pass this on every time we do it to tenants because their rents are already high and you can't just dollar for dollar take these increases in water, in property taxes and just hand it on to your tenants um, and half the residents of Northampton are half our voters are tenants. So you can't, you can't just keep doing that. Um, so the override is our only option. And when you look at new growth, unless it's commercial new growth, it really doesn't help us because residential new growth usually costs more in school tuitions than you generate in property taxes. Your average house does not support one student in school for one year or 12 years. So residential new growth actually costs us money. A commercial new growth really does end up affecting the bottom line. I, I do feel that we have a responsibility to put this question to the citizens of Northampton. And this is one of those occasions when we can say, how do you want us to run our city? But the citizens have a responsibility to come out and vote on this. You know, we've said, here's what will happen uh, if, if these funds aren't available. And I don't really like the way they're made available, but it's the only mechanism we have. But I think it is our responsibility to ask our constituents by putting on this ballot, what do you want us to do? And sometimes they say no. I think East Hampton said no to one of these very recently. They voted for school construction, but they said no to this general style override. So citizens can vote them up or they can vote them down. But I don't feel the people I represent that I can deny them the right to go to the polls and vote on this. And they have to show up and do it. I think ultimately we do need to press the state for a reallocation of tax dollars. and and. Uh, Representative Cocott, when I mentioned that it's the yes meeting, he said, you know, send me something home rule. I don't want to home rule a new tax on Northampton. I want to redistribute some of the tax money leaving town now. I mean, we get half the hotel motel tax, but less than a percent of the meals tax. The state harvests five and a half million dollars a year out of here in meals tax every year. I'd sure love them to split that with its 50-50 like they split the, uh, the hotel motel room tax. And you know, I've, I've been here eight years now, and I hear the same thing, take-home cars, cell phones. I mean, that so nibbles around the edge of our problem. We're $1.4 million off this year. We could take away every used cruiser that somebody drives home and every cell phone we subsidize. It's not going to make a dent in that number. I mean, this is a real structural problem that pops up. And even with the mayor's proposal, 
it kicks the can five years. Two million maybe sends it three years. Two and a half sends it five years. But in the fifth year, we're $1.965 million in the hole again okay. if we don't find other sources of revenue. So, and it's the only option we have. I wish there was another one, but we just, you know, so two and a, two and a half million kicks it a little further down the road. But it's still going to be out there and it's still going to come back to haunt us again if we don't pressure the state to give us other sources of revenue. Uh, because I certainly don't want to come up with some new and clever home rule way to suck more money out of the citizens of Northampton when we're exporting dollars out of here to the state. And I, I might just be me, but I don't really always like the way they spend it. I'd rather have it here. I don't mind, you know, to some extent, at least our property tax dollars stay here. I just find, like to find a more equitable way to collect this extra money every year so we don't have to keep doing this every three to five years. Councilor Adams. <laughs> Mr. President, do you, I, I just have some commentary. Do you want to keep the discussion now? No, no, no. I, I think this is wide open. This is a okay. critical ballot initiative that, we're, that, that there's a responsibility to actually speak to it. So mm -hmm. I, I think that um, asking for an override is not some sort of admission of mismanagement. I think that on the part of, of the mayor, there's been very good management. I think that this council has done a, a good job of, of safeguarding the taxpayer's dollar. And um, the, the cuts that will occur if this doesn't pass is, is not alarmism. They actually will occur. We're not going to find $1.4 million anywhere. It's not going to happen. And I do believe that if the cuts happen, it will be devastating. Again, it's not alarmism. And recently, this council um, passed a resolution in support of the governor's proposal, which is not going to happen. But the, the proposal uh, in support coming from this council um, passed, but there was some opposition stating that um, in part, they, they, the opposition wished that there was a way that we could um, get more money from the state. Well, I share that concern, and this is a way that we can raise money, and every single cent of it will stay here. And so um, it will stay here. It will be built into the tax base permanently or into the repeal of Proposition 2.5, whatever happens first. So, again, this is a way that we can raise it and keep it. We don't have to send it to Boston and hope some of it comes back. It will all stay here. And I also appreciate that the amount is not simply to fix the gap, that the, the additional money, the additional $1.1 million that we will have after the gap is closed, um, I'm, I'm thankful that the mayor um, will use this for reserves, which will um, help our bond rating, which, is, which has been jeopardized, we learned from our, from our last evaluation. And, um, and that and, and when our bond rating lowers, uh, we lose money when we go to bonds. So um, this will boost our reserves. This will, will, this will fix the deficit. And I also appreciate very much that there is a, a, a plan going into um, the next several years here and that it's not, and that there's more to it than, than just fixing uh, the immediate problem. Um, and also I appreciate Councillor Dwight's point very much about how it's really important for the public to note that, that when we, um, do certain projects like buying land that we're preserving um, through CPA money or doing or, or, or lending money to, to service net or giving money to service net so that they can lend it so that people can get first lesson security and, and, and get off the streets that um, that those sorts of expenditures are all from CPA money and that they simply cannot be spent it's not legal for them to be spent um, to for teachers and for the cuts that we would that would happen if if the override didn't pass on on the on the city side in addition to the schools so i i thank the mayor for this i support putting it on the ballot and i also support its passage as well i'll see if i got that order right uh i think it was Councilor freeman daniels next council of the barge Councilor tacy you're all okay yeah. with that she had her hand up first if we're going around the second time no she he did we're gonna have a fight here don't <laughs> have so no, chival don't have chivalrous Councilor freeman daniels uh yeah, I, I, um, I echo Councillor Adams' uh, sage comments, uh, but to my mind, this is a vote about putting it on the ballot. And uh, really the germane issue is uh, if we have a budget shortfall of roughly 1.4 or one and a half million dollars, why are we asking for another one million? Uh, and so the, the key presentation today should be about what that million dollars does and uh, where it goes and, and how it's used. And um, I'm, I'm uh, also uh, gratified um, 
and and uh, and edified that uh, that the mayor is creating a reserve fund. Um, I'm going to be even more impressed if next year there's uh, which <laughs> I won't be around for, but if next year there's truly a nearly half a million dollar budget surplus, that will be very impressive. Um, but uh, the, the numbers are are relatively conservative. Uh, the mayor is showing um, pretty significant increases in expenditures, and um, and not very liberal increases in revenues. Uh, so I, I think that uh, these projections, um, which are just projections, but they uh, they use history, which is uh, the best the tool we have for understanding the future, and. Um, Except in the stock market, right? Well, actually, no. I, right. That's that's, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's my other walk of life. Exactly. Yeah. We are allowed to say that, um, but uh, but uh, I, I think that um, the citizens around Hampton should be allowed to uh, vote vote on on um, increasing their taxes. And uh, you know, I would just want to one more thing. I just want to point out, and this is not a comment to the mayor. It's just a general comment. Um, we, we uh, America has has changed um, from original, you know, democracies and representative governments from being a, a class-based system to a to a, a, a citizen-based system. And um, you know, we, we don't think it's funny that uh, the citizens get to vote on the corporate tax rate. For for instance, we don't we don't say only corporations can vote on the corporate tax rate. Uh, so it, it it is fair um, under the system of. Of, of government that we have that uh, that all citizens all voters can uh, can vote on uh, a property tax increase uh, thank you uh, council of the barge yes. mayor I want to thank you very much for coming in and doing this presentation um, the problem I'm having is that I wish we had the budget hearings before this was placed on the ballot I would like to see exactly every department every staff what they make and i know you've done this without a problem okay it took a lot of work for your department heads to do this but to actually see the budget book is so valuable to me but let me finish please i'm going to support this to place it on the ballot but i've had some residents calling me with concerns because you apparently have mentioned at the budget hearings to the effect that how people had been laid off before. And I don't recall, as far as I've been a city councilor, that we've had people laid off. I thought if they retired, we did not fulfill those positions. So some of my calls are coming on hearing you say that people had been laid off and this time we've got people being laid off. Is it an actual layoff or is it going to be people who are retired and not fill the positions within the city? Well, uh, so in the, in the prior, uh, in the current fiscal year that we're in, in, um, in FY13, and I would just say to you that in terms of, like, we do have a line right. item budget for the year that we're operating in right now, and it's you can a, see every that. salary, and you can I see every that. assumption, and that's, and so that's sort of the base that we use, and then, you know, FY14, um, you know, comes off of that, and, and. But you've uh, taken it off of that, too, correct? In some ways, yes. We're, yes. We're, we're, well, what we're doing and what you'll see in FY14 is we've gone to all of our departments and we've said, you've got to level fund your budget. So you've got to cut your budgets in order to level fund. Um, and so, and last year, uh, you may recall, uh, we eliminated two positions. We eliminated the parking uh, division as a standalone entity, and we eliminated uh, two positions that were in that department, eliminated them. One person, uh, uh, retired uh, uh, so prior to the elimination of that position, uh, but we eliminated it. Um, so that was sort of a timing issue. There was also an administrative staffer. That position was eliminated. Um, we, as as you well know, there was a position in the clerk's office that we um, also uh, uh, did not refill, or, or, or uh, it was a it was a, a part-time position. Um, that I know that there was quite some discussion about, but we did not refill that position. And then on the school side, uh, there were uh, there were several positions that were eliminated as well. Um, uh, the schools are a little bit different because under their contr contracts, 
they actually lay off many of their people in, in like April, or have to give notices to people in April and then rehire them. And in this case, these are people that aren't rehired. Uh, they're off. And so we eliminated positions in last year's budget. And I can get you the details on the positions. I understand that, but yeah. that's not what I'm talking about, Mayor. When we've had previous Prop 2 and a halfs, it was brought up about people were being laid off. And, and that, some of the city staff were telling me, talking to me recently, who's, who was laid off, okay? People were not, apparently, who had retired. They left those positions, left them alone, and they didn't fill them. So this is why I'm curious about, are we going to actually lay off people working for the city, or... If they're retiring, we're not going to fill them. That's well, my well certainly uh, there are if there are cases where we have so if we have to eliminate four positions, uh, you know, in the in the police department, for example. So if there are retirements between now and the next fiscal year, uh, and if they're in areas where if that fits in with the budget, then we would not fill those positions. That and that would actually you know be beneficial if that <laughs> happened that way. Um, but there are some cases where. Uh, there may be uh, people that are being hired to go to the academy, et cetera, that we may have to then revoke their appointment to the police department. So it does vary depending on, but the main thing to understand is there will be four or less police officers as part of our police force, and that will have an impact um, on the way that we patrol our city, on the ability to provide uh, downtown coverage and, and foot coverage and bike coverage, and it's going to change, it will have an impact on the three shifts. Um, and again, uh, you know, the same thing on the schools. Uh, there, and there's a very detailed list of uh, positions that are either being eliminated down to almost, you know, you know, less than part-time positions, and we may lose those staffers altogether because they may not be able to live on a job that's point two. Um, but there are other positions that are being outright eliminated. So, um, so on July 1st, those positions won't be here anymore. And, um, and the other thing you also have to understand is that um, uh, we may, um, uh, you may eliminate a position, but also because of personnel regulations and rules uh, there and seniority rights, that person may in turn uh, move into another position and, or bump someone of lesser seniority. Um, so that's the other factor. So someone's position may be eliminated and they may be laid off but because of their seniority, they have the option to move in. So it also gets complicated there. Right. That, for an example, would have been our previous council clerk who worked for the planning department, got her pink slip, but the job came up for being a council clerk, so she slid into that. That is correct. That does yeah. happen. What those, I'm just trying yeah. to do, Mayor, mm -hmm. is straighten out what I'm being told as a counselor of the previous Prop 2 and a halfs that nobody was laid off. The thing that actually occurred was people who retired the positions were not filled. Yeah. My concern is, because I don't have the budget, budget book with me, but anyways, are we going to be actually laying off people, or if they are retiring, are we going to fulfill it? That's yes or no. It's <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I know it is. Yeah. And it's sort of a case. Yes, I mean it's a case. Obviously, it's a case by case it, budgetary situation. If I may, so. I think we're we're struggling with semantics here. Yeah. Well, I'm the just trying of, to ask. Can I, allow me? Allow me for a second. One thing. Yes. But one of the things we're striving. One of the details we're striving to include in the budget that I will give you, um, in the next for the fiscal year 14, and this is a new detail that we're trying to now add and, and keep track of for people because I know this is an issue, is the number of full-time employees in each department and provide a historical tracking for that. I'm looking at Susan to make sure that I'm not, uh, we are working on that piece. Uh, and so, um, so that you'll be able to see how many were there, full-time employees were there in 13 versus in 14. Okay. Um, and so we're trying to build that into the budget so that when we have, so that if people think we're adding lots of employees or they think we're not eliminating employees, um, but I can try to get you more clear detail, like on FY13, what happened. I, I um, really appreciate that. I mean, in the case of, you know, the, the, in, here in, in City Hall, there was a position that was going to be advertised to be refilled. Someone left the job, 
and we eliminated the position. So uh, yes, a person didn't get laid off, but a service was, you know, a, a service position was eliminated. I just I wanted yeah, to clarify exactly. that, Mayor. Most definitely. But I thank you for being here. I am supporting it, placing it on the ballot. And I feel that um, we have no choice but to place this on the ballot. I agree with Councilor David Murphy that it is our rights as councilors to make sure that every voter here in the city of Northampton, and I'm not laughing about it, has the rights to go into those polls because that's their constitutional right. So as a counselor, I'm, I'm gonna vote for this, placing it on the ballot, let them go in there to vote, either in their hearts, do they wanna support it, or if they do not wanna support it. That's it. Uh, Thank counselor you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, counselor Tacey, yeah. you're next. First off, I want to say I'm a Susan Wright fan and a, <laughs> and a fan of the mayor's. And I, I appreciate you being here and doing this. This is, this is great. So I'm not picking on anybody again. But we get into retirement stuff. Right now we're, we put 3.9 or almost $4 million into, out of the general fund into the retirement plan, which we are obligated on these retirements. There's no, no question about it. And then we're going to add another, an additional $243,000 this year. That is correct. This year. Will we do that again next year? That looks like we're going to do that until probably 2019. That was a that was an assessment that was made as kind of a course correction uh, because of the uh, because of the the, um, the actuarials. Help. And so we, we were actually to stay on the current actuarial path would have required a much larger assessment to get us back on track again to make up for returns that didn't happen in the in the previous years so we asked them to make this uh to make a smaller adjustment extend the glide path which is what they've done and so you'll see um in our uh in our uh estimate over here for retirement uh you'll see that you know that's incorporated into 14 and again we're looking at this the average annual contribution and we're using that five percent number which is what we believe it will be going forward um, and that's part of the genesis of the impetus of the question on personnel it like for um like ambulance personnel there's a retirement that goes along with all this i mean it's all a big picture no it's doubt more about than it. just this particular number there's also there's there's benefits that we looked at municipalities nationwide uh some are at 60 40 on on health insurance we're at 80 20. Um, have we looked at maybe 25, 75? I know we continue. We always continue to do plan design changes and things such as that, and we've saved many dollars on plan design changes, even different, even co-pays and things such as that. So my only question is, on I agree that it should go on the ballot, but if I had all, if I had the information, I, I thought I could make a really informed decision to say, yes, we need to do this right away and I have all this information but maybe by the second reading I will have it is there gonna be two readings on this absolutely yeah, definitely I'm so asking and it will be in two weeks or you I talked believe about it's May 2nd May 2nd okay. you talked about putting off the vote on the budget yeah I was talking about after. the second reading on the final budget till till the fourth week in June okay. to wait for so you're not producing two budgets one with well, or without well my well we're going to produce one without uh that will be we'll produce the without budget which you'll see you know that'll that that and you'll have that and that'll include the you know the all the cuts we're talking about and and i believe that will provide you with an opportunity if you believe that there's additional cuts that could be made to find savings um that will be an opportunity to do that um but, I, but i'm not talking about cuts i'm just talking about information just information just so informed make an and informed I will do decision. my best to provide you with some information I cannot guarantee you that I can provide the level of a detailed analysis but I yeah. can do my best to provide you with some additional information um, although again uh, yeah we can we can try to get you some information about that thank you um, uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels is next and then Councilor Adams small thing this is a little bit bigger than my scanner can we get an electronic 
version. Of yeah, this we, we'll be company. doing. Um, we'll be putting online uh, a PDF version, and it will be actually a. We'll, we're going to make it two pages. And, Thank you. Because it's, we've done it on eight and a half and eleven, and and it's impossible to read. We tried a legal size. Many people don't have legal size, so we're going to basically cut that one in half and have it be two, eight and a half by eleven verticals in a two-page PDF. We'll put it right on the website where people have will have access Thank to you. it. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Adams, then Councilor Tacy. Um, Mayor, in a presentation earlier this year to the City Council and School Committee, you gave us um, a good amount of information. In that, we learned that the average single family tax bill for this city is lower than average by about $700. Um, would you be able to, to w if the override passed, would you be able to? reconfigure that to determine if we'd still be below average as compared to the state average uh in terms of what the uh, we can try to look at that i mean the the that data is always changing because tax rates are changing every year so we can look at what dor has for data right now and try to give you a projection on what that is um uh so i can try to get you that before second reading we could do our i know i know that there's a chart there's a couple of charts in the budget presentation where we showed how our uh, you know, our tax bill on an average single family home compares to other homes in the valley. Um, and, and so you could extrapolate from that where we would move. I don't think it would actually, I don't think we'd actually change positions. Uh, I think on that one, it's, it's us, then I think it's East Long Meadow, Amherst and Long Meadow, I think. And so I, I don't actually think we'd, I think we'd stay in the same position, but I can do some checking on that and find out. Um, our tax rate, you know, was the lowest, but that's a little bit diff misleading because our values are also quite high, so, and those two things kind of work in, in, in concert. But we can try to figure out where this would put us in terms of the average. But right now we have a below, our tax rate is below the state average for a single family home. Yeah. Councilor Tacey. It's just too bad we couldn't run this override like we run the CPA if a household doesn't make quite that much money. They could be exempt. Well, we do offer we do offer you know exemptions. Uh, I've seen them for That's for awful. people that are low income and elderly, and and uh, and those exemptions will be in play, and people always have that opportunity to go through that process. Um, and we're you know we've uh, you know n noted that we are projecting an increase in our overlay uh, because we've had a an increase in people an availing themselves of those exemptions. Um, so. Uh, so it's a little misleading. I had some calls about the socioeconomic numbers of there were twenty four thousand uh, dollars per capita. It's not uh, per household or anything, but That's I had to try and explain that yes. if you had a if there was three people in the household, it was seventy five thousand right. dollars. You know, if we had parents and a kid, but I had there was a lot of confusion when I mentioned that. Okay. It is per capita. The twenty four thousand dollar is the income per capita, not. That's what it is. Not forever. I just didn't want anybody to think that I was right. lowballing. Lowballing. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are a lot of people. If that's the average, there's a lot with a lot less. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Murphy. Um, one number we didn't talk about. We talked about the average, in, the increase on the average home being, you know, rounded to $235 pretty much for the average home. But if it was fiscal year 13, the actual impact on the tax rate would be 79 cents. Now, it will be a little different next year because it's based on the value of the city, and the value of the city changes every year, and we won't know what the value of the city is next right. year until we get there. Mm -hmm. But if it was this year, it comes out to about 79 cents per thousand in value. So if people want to figure out what the actual impact is on them, this year, use your value this year in 79 cents, because there are people above and below average, and they may want to be able to figure that out and we hadn't mentioned that number so I just wanted to throw that out there. right it's eight, eight percent uh, Councilor Adams will the website have the, the, the property tax calculator up again we're gonna try to bring that back just so that people could have a way to plug in their numbers and 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 factor that in um, yeah I don't mean to that's fine put you in the hot seat here the your negotiations or your um, discussions with the state and the Smith School to it. How is that? 
I know you've been in the hot seat there. Is that something you can discuss, or is that something you would rather not? I uh, I move we put that on the on the uh, information request from the mayor. End of this meeting. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, well, now there's a question here because it, I think Councilor Tacey's asking something that's germane to uh, the override. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's that, that, that um, it, I, I think it's a fair question. I, I think that, um, yeah, I'll leave it. So to I'll, you. I don't know if there's something, if it's privileged information or if it, No, I, I, I mean, I can tell you that um, uh, you may recall last year that uh, uh, there was a, um, a bit of a disagreement between myself and the and my fellow trustees at Smith Folk about the size of their budget, and uh, they um, they voted on a larger budget than I actually allocated to them, uh, and uh, the, a similar thing is playing out this year as well. Uh, and you know we're we're trying to work through that, uh, and uh, and I have made no secret about the fact. And since I become a trustee there, I've been asking lots of questions about the structure and trying to figure out are there ways we can uh, build efficiencies uh, into a system right now where we're trying to run two school systems in one city. Um, and that's a longer term conversation. Again, that's one of the things I'll be working on when you look at a plan like this is are there ways we can find efficiencies to make this last longer? And that is one of the ones that we'll be looking at. Um, so that's going to be a budget that they've uh, that we'll now be moving that forward and it'll be part of the budget process uh, that you'll have of the two school systems and the larger city budget. Yeah. That was only that was the reason I brought it up. Mm -hmm. I, Your Honor, uh, uh, just just a point of information. I, I've, I've tried we have access to all the salary line items in the city except I cannot find the line item salary for Smith Vocational, is that, are those yeah, right. available? Well, that's uh, one of the other areas that I've been working on is uh, trying to have the same level of uh, a budget detail uh, that we provide in our in our city budget and in our school budget, and that's one of the other um, issues that I'm working on as a trust. Again, I'm in my role as a trustee. I'm one of uh, one of five trustees. Um, I wear kind of two hats, like I do on the school committee, um, uh, but I also play the role of mayor and and uh, and I will be insisting upon some of that detail and and as well as you know asserting my right to put forth a budget that I believe is is the the one that's most responsible for the city budget so that's I think that's more of a discussion for the budget process right. and we'll play that will play out and it, and it should be recognized it's uh, Smith vocational is an anomaly there's no other system similar to it in the state it is very unique, and it's it's a good. That's a good thing. It's a it's a it has a proud history, and is a is a great school, and I want to see it sustained. Uh, my issues are more around uh, uh, you know governance and 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 those kinds of issues that I want to try to address, which are the same issues I have for all areas of city government. I'm I'm um, you know uh, I often joke to people that you know just because we've done it for a hundred years isn't to me a, a rational reason for why we keep doing it. Um, is it working? Does it make sense? Uh, uh, with shrinking resources, does it make sense? So, you know, I'm going to ask those questions, and that's no different whether it's Smith Volk or NPS or, or the DPW. Uh, Councilor LaBarge and Thank then you. Councilor Tacey. I can recall um, with our former mayor several years ago, the same issue was brought up about that school, and we had plenty of meetings. Uh, which way that that school should go and they were looking at it being or becoming state operated so but it never happened families work things out um, like I said our former mayor Mary Claire Higgins we had a tremendous amount of meetings on that so we were able to not let that happen so and I just want to what's happening here I appreciate the questions I do want to caution you about not having this turn into a uh, right an issue that wasn't part of the agenda and and so that would be my only concern about that's going any further down the road but I understand that uh, so uh, a, a continued conversation on the ballot initiative before us Councilor Tacey and the uh, I see all the taxes and the fees and all this the permitting and everything the prices seem to continue to go up and line items go up uh, and then uh, state-owned land payment in lieu of taxes uh, is a flat 105 101 576 so have you spoke to the governor about that uh, well, I think myself and a lot of cities and towns would love to have the, the state government pay more for their state land. Um, but as you know, they're in a bit of a situation with their budget. Um, 
I did want to, you asked a question earlier. Well, you asked a couple of questions earlier. I would just comment to you. I know that one of the reasons I was waiting to finalize these numbers was we were waiting for the House budget uh, to be submitted. Um, and I do want to report to you that in the area of Chapter 70 aid, the House budget um, gave us uh, $200 more um, than the governor's budget. Uh, and that, uh, and actually, re uh, uh, general government aid actually reduced what we w would, would have received under the governor's budget, although we never thought we'd get everything that was under the governor's budget, so we actually had reduced our projections. So, um, so in that, I think we um, I think there's about six thousand additional dollars that we're seeing uh, in in new aid uh, uh, based on the house budget. So I did want to wait till that budget came out to see what those numbers were uh, to factor it into this proposal. But there was no um, no silver bullet there. I don't think we expected that. But I did I felt it was important to wait to see what the legislature proposed. The other question I wanted to answer because you raised it was about the, um, the percentages for health insurance. And while there's this new health insurance reform law, which we, you, this council adopted, I've utilized, does give me great authority, one of the things it still reserves to collective bargaining is this issue of uh, the percentages uh, uh, in terms of the contribution of the city versus employees. Um, so that is a subject of collective bargaining, and, and it is a conversation that we will be having going forward but it's just not something I can unilaterally change. Uh, uh, there's an impact, a financial impact that has to be negotiated. So I just wanted to make that clear that I, we don't have the ability to just unilaterally change that. So uh, another point of information, Councilor Adams and I yesterday had the, we were invited to an MMA presentation about, uh, and the MMA was crowing about the fact that they favored the legislature budget, the budget that the Senate and the, and the legislature versus the governor's budget uh, crowing about the great benefits and enhancements in, in Chapter 70 funds that will be appreciated and reap and rain down upon us with large S. I'm so pleased to hear that it amounts about $200. It made me a little cranky, but I, uh, that actually that's an opinion. I'll just reserve the, any further comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, are there any other questions for the mayor on this ballot question? Not for two more weeks. Not for two more weeks. <laughs> then I would ask the clerk to call the roll to put this forward in the first reading to make <laughs> to put this ballot initiative on the ballot uh, for the June thirtieth election. Twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. I'm sorry, stand correct. Twenty fourth. Yes. Councilor Casey. Abstain. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Boyd? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Lavar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Uh, it has passed the first reading. Um, thank you, Your Honor, for that presentation. Um, you're probably going to want to stick around for the next item. Uh, Councilor Adams? Council President, I think Councilor Lavar wants a break. Uh, the Councilor has called for a recess. We will have a seven minute recess. Seven? Wow. Seven okay. minutes precisely. <sighs> Enough for you, Jesse.
Welcome back. Uh, we're out of recess and we're reconvening the city council meeting for uh, April 18th, 2013. Uh, the next order of business is this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Committee on Economic Development, Housing and Land Use. Order that the city of Northampton, having accepted the provisions of Chapter 43D of the Massachusetts General Laws as amended, approves the filing of an application with the Interagency Permitting Board for the designation of the Roundhouse parking lot property located at 260 Main Street as a priority development site or take any other action in relation thereto. Accept the motion. I move to second. Approve. And it's been seconded. Uh, discussion, the mayor is still recognized, of course. So <coughs> direct questions to him if you'd like. Um, but who would like to go first? Councilor Tate. I just want to express I'm a little bit gun shy from our last ordeal in that lot and uh, it cost us a bundle uh, so but I'm gonna support it um, we'll give it another shot we'll see what happens um, but good luck okay <laughs> do you want you want to make your case for this uh, if I could just provide some background because I did, I you. did come to the um, the committee on economic development housing and land use to present this information and seek their support for bringing forward the measure that's before you um, uh, I know it's included in your packet, but the original surplus order uh, for this parcel, uh, which was adopted uh, December 1st, 2005, one of the stipulations was that the roundhouse parking lot, you know, would be uh, would be surplus to city needs, and the mayor was authorized to sell the property uh, in consultation with the city's economic development, housing, and land use. So mm -hmm. I did meet with them uh, at their last meeting uh, to discuss um, my my plan for moving forward with the redevelopment of that property. Um, and part of that included uh, working with the state's economic development agency, Mass Development, to take advantage of some of the technical services and real estate and development services that they offer. Um, and uh, that would include um, being given access to uh, uh, redevelopment, uh, a redevelopment study of the property uh, by an outside firm um, who could help us uh, work through a, a new process for um, developing a new RFP uh, for that property. And that process would include, again, the consultation not only with the, uh, the council through the EDLU committee, but it's my goal to, to make sure that we include uh, lots of input from the community, from stakeholders, from the development community, uh, and from the many people who've already expressed interest in the site as well. Um, and be able to put this uh, this valuable piece of property back out um, to, for an RFP to see if we can find uh, a, a, a buyer who could develop it um, in the spirit of the um, of, of the again the original resolution, which I would point out um, uh, required that uh, we not only um, you know maintained the uh, the parking and public access to Pulaski Park but obviously there was a, a major focus on uh, on creating jobs on uh, on sustained property tax revenue etc um, and so we want to try to see if we can meet those goals and and see a project that would uh, that would um, fit in with uh, with the downtown so one of the pieces of that is um, we accepted a law back in 2008 uh, that allows for the designation of priority development sites. We did that actually in relation to Village Hill. Um, so this council uh, accepted that law and we designated Village Hill as a priority development site, um, which gave us access again to these same kinds of services um, and it also uh, sort of was a statement on the part of the city that this is a key area um, for development, and it also, you know, gets us on a statewide listing of those kinds of uh, priority sites all around the Commonwealth. So, as part of what we're doing with our work with Mass Development, we're asking that the I'm asking for the council to authorize my adding the Roundhouse site to our to our list of priority development sites in the city, um, which will you know, serve that other purpose I just described of. Of uh, promoting this as a key priority development site, city-owned property, um, but also giving us access to uh, to the kinds of services I've described, working with mass development and potentially future access to things like brownfields grants, etc. Um, 
I, I noted you were talking earlier about the cultural district designation and the fact that um, it, it may provide access to uh, or priority status, and, and, and this is a similar model as well, although this is obviously a more well-established one. The way that the actual redevelopment study would work is mass development would fund that redevelopment study, um, uh, and, uh, and the city would not be obligated to pay for that study until such time that an RFP was successful and the property was sold, and then we would uh, pay that money back to um, mass development at that time from the proceeds. It's a $15,000 uh, cost, and then those monies are put back into mass development's community funds that they work with other communities. So it's uh, that's sort of the program, and uh, it seemed like a good fit for what we were trying to do. Uh, 2005 was the last sort of major redevelopment study that was done. Uh, Kuhn Riddle Architects uh, did an analysis, a market analysis, and looked at, uh, at different buildings that could be sited on the property. Um, so I think first and foremost, we want to update that analysis because there's been a lot of changes, um, zoning and the economy, uh, in office, retail, hotel, all those various sectors. So we really want to go back and take a look at what may be uh, uh, the best uh, uses for this kind of property um, and, and in, 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 um, inform uh, whatever RFP we put together and put out on the street. Uh, point of clarification, this actually spins off of Councilor Tacey's expressed shyness about <laughs> of revisiting this, but the, uh, you had said that you were talking about including stakeholders, developers, and persons who have expressed interest in the property before. Do you mean interest, are you saying people who have expressed concerns uh, or people who have expressed interest? I mean, th the question being for clarification, we're inviting every public, everybody who is, uh, because this is a community asset. We're exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly, and and um, and and so we're going to try to put together a process, and I'm and I'm committed. I've made that commitment to the Edlu committee that I will work with them along the way and, and try to involve them actually in that process, um, and so that we can ensure that we do have that we do get. Um, and again, you know, we have to also, you know, we're going to try to to focus. You know, we're bringing in professionals who can help us focus on on sort of the realities of the market and what. Um, you know what is viable, what may be viable for that kind of a site, um, so that and then try to get input as well from the community about it and from stakeholders about it, so that that RFP is informed by all of the, the all of that information. Um, and, and, and we'll see what happens from we'll there. See what Thank you. Uh, any other questions, Councilor? Well, I, I agree with resetting and restarting the development process, and I also um, agree that maximizing the development potential. And um, and also in a way that's consistent with downtown ca downtown's character is important. Um, my question is a little bit is related to Councillor Dwight's, and um, some of us remember, maybe most of us, the the uproar over the process in 2007, when um, the after um, the hotel or during the hotel issue, and actually that 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 process or that. Concern about process also led in part to the best practices committee, which was formed after that. So, um, it's my understanding from hearing tonight that the stakeholder meetings will be, um, will the general public will also be invited? Most definitely, yeah, most okay. definitely. And 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 I know I know I know we've had a number of um, in, in the intervening years since that process, and and you know we we we've done um, some of the. Um, sort of the charrette processes there was the zoning revisions committee and there have been neighborhood based meetings and again uh, those types of uh, approaches um, to try to get people to come and talk about ideas and and and, and look at uh, you know actual visuals of things and try to get people to react to them um, and uh, and so that's that would be the sort of stuff that I would imagine um, um, and I, I village Hill is also a priority development site and they also ha had along with them Citizens Advisory Committee, right, which you were on, and and that met over a long period of time, right? Yeah, the um, Citizens Advisory Committee was created by the legislation. That's correct. So, and also I think about the process regarding the Florence Reuse Committee. I know it's slightly different because at this point, um, it's been several years since this property has been surplused, and um, we just surplused the, the Florence Reuse. Uh, but I thought that was a good process with the Reuse Committee, and I'm wondering. If there's any room for a sort of ad hoc committee 
in this instance. Yeah, that was actually one of the things uh, when when we, depending on this and when, when I met, next met with the um, with the Edlu and I mentioned, I did mention the reuse committee model, that it may be um, using the Edlu committee plus adding some ad hoc members to it um, uh, could help be kind of an advisory co consultative committee to uh, to me about this process, similar to the other one. I, I know that when we originally uh, last year, um, when we settled the lawsuit, I know that you know, and I know you and I talked. My initial impulse was maybe we put together a you know just a standalone committee uh, to work on this. Um, and one of my first concerns was you know a committee without a professional staff, without somebody to help guide the process, would be problematic. And then when I sat down and, and thought about, okay, who would I, you know, if I want to put stakeholders on this committee, I want to put butters, I want to put, you know, my city solicitor quickly reminded me that all of those people would have immediate conflicts of interest that would prevent them from serving on that type of a committee. Um, so that model, while it sounded good at the time, didn't really seem workable because if you're putting somebody, you know, a direct butter on a decision-making committee or a recommending committee, it can be problematic. So we would, so, so I do want to use that. I, I think that was a good model, actually, sort of a hybrid of a council committee and then bringing in some additional people uh, to help. That, work. So that is your intention? Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, again, I, I, I would ultimately be the, the Edlu committee, you know, who would have to make that determination like the finance committee did, but something comparable to that. Because I think it, was, it created some efficiency of having the two committees kind of working together mm -hmm. um, as opposed to having two separate, you know, processes. Um, and I think it was beneficial to the members of the finance committee, and I think that the folks who served on the ad hoc side felt it was a good process. So something like that, um, uh, and that would be, again, a decision for the ed I'd want to work with the EDLU committee on that. Um, uh, but having some elected officials, I think, is important, you know, and, and clearly the, the, the language is clear that I'm supposed to consult with EDLU on this particular issue. Um, uh, so that, that's a great... Definitely, we're going to try to follow through on that. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, th thank you, uh, Mr. President. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for going through this. I, I understand that the, the scope of work that, that uh, Mass Development and, and Utile have been uh, talking about is just kind of their first take on it. And it exactly. doesn't have a lot of, it doesn't show that much public interaction it says it talks about stakeholders and city officials and so um you know we're voting on this uh or I'm, i i would like to vote on this mm -hmm. to get the process started but yeah. i i do ex i do hope that that well, that language does get um expanded or reworked and and if so i i look forward to it um i think it'll be a a more you know socially just way of uh, of building a hotel or anything, anything, not just a hotel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he's just, he's dealing with repressment. <laughs> uh, Councillor Labarge. Thank you. Mayor, thank you for going over on this order. I think the process is great. I think that it is time that we really look at this site. We've done it before for quite a while. And look what happened. We ended up with it's still there. So I want to thank you for bringing this forth, and it is time that we start looking on which direction we're going in. Well, and again, I, I always try to remind people, you know, we have the, sometimes we talk about these things separately, the budget, we talk about economic development, but the two are, are intertwined because that, that new growth number that we always talk okay. about, that's the one, that's the other way we can grow our tax base is by promoting economic development. So it's very vital to the other conversation we had earlier, so. Thank you. Yeah, Councilor Tacey. Yeah, I just hope that when an RFP goes out, everybody has a, a bite at it and has a look and um and we don't get too restrictive so as to eliminate bidders or um did we, did we don't reach out to people like curran uh that owns the roundhouse or so we will cast a wide net that would be my goal and i think the same goal uh that i took away from the florence reuse center is trying to create a an rfp that is broad enough that it could invite a number of different proposals so thank you. So thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, this will be a roll call vote for the. Councilor Kelly. Yes. 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 Councilor Kel
Tracy? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Joy? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Barr? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor is not here. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is upon the recommendation of the Finance Committee, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, uh, Councilor uh, Jean Tacey, Councilor Pamela Schwartz, and Planning and Sustainability. And this is the, um, would, you, would you like me to read the order? It's, it's relatively brief and we've got so much time, if you guys are okay. It's, <coughs> whereas the Open Space Recreation Multi-Use Trail Plan of 2011-2018 recommends extending the city's rail trail network and generally rehabilitating it as needed. And whereas the city under the care and custody of the Conservation Commission and subject to Mass General Law <coughs> Chapter 40, Section 8C, owns the land necessary to extend the rail trail from its northern terminus in Leeds to one of the most spectacular riverfront locations in the city. And whereas the city has already sustain, uh, substantially completed the design of the extending the trail and rehabilitating the one existing structure necessary for the rail trail, Beaverbrook Bridge for a project with a total cost of $500,000. And whereas the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs is offering reimbursable grants to cities and towns to support the rehabilitation and expansion of trails through the Land Use and Water Con Conservation Fund uh, Act which allows for 50% reimbursement and now therefore be it ordered that the mayor be and is hereby authorized to file and accept grants from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs and that the mayor be and is hereby authorized to take such other actions as are necessary to carry out the terms, purposes and conditions of this grant to be administered by the Planning and Sustainability Office on behalf of the Conservation Commission and the City Council <clears throat> appropriates the, and authorizes the city treasurer with the approval of the mayor to borrow $500,000 over 15 years under Mass General Law Chapter 44B uh, and Mass General Law Chapter 44H-C uh, uh, or any other enabling authority for the purpose of improvement of public multi-use rail trails and that this order shall take effect upon passage. Is there a motion? So move to approve. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, uh, would you like to recognize uh, the planning to recognize uh, yes. the planning director? Second uh, that. All those in favor of recognizing Aye. Wayne Fiden? Aye. Thank you, Aye. Wayne. Thanks. Um, so this is an exciting project. This is the, currently the rail trail ends and leaves at Grove Avenue. Um, and the Conservation Commission owns a piece of property, which is basically uh, 0.35 miles, 1,910 feet north from where the rail trail goes. Um, and so this grant would allow us to extend the trail that 1,910 feet, um, which doesn't sound like a huge distance, but it does two things. One is it crosses the Beaverbrook Bridge, which is an absolutely spectacular bridge. If you know the bridge at Arch Street, it's basically its twin, except for instead of a road going underneath it, there's a river that goes underneath it. Um, so it's a really you know, spectacular bridge that's there. The bridge was built, I'm not exactly sure when, but about 130 years ago. Um, it was maintained until about 50 years ago when the railroad stopped using it. Um, and at that point, absolutely no work took place. So trees that were you know, 12 inches or 18 inches in diameter were growing through the bridge and hadn't been repointed. And so it's in bad need of, of work. Um, and then the trail itself, a little bit north of the bridge, is really one of the spectacular sections in town because you're right above the Mill River. So there's other places where there, you have like little views of the Mill River, but this place, the, the trail is going right next to the river. So it's a really nice opportunity and, and it will become a nice dead end for the trail right now. Um, the trail has already been designed because originally we had planned to build the trail right up to the Wimmersburg town line. The, the source of funding for all the trails we've built in the last few years was transportation money. And Mass DOT, late in the process, said, oh, we won't let you build a trail that dead ends. The trail can only, because, because their money's in the transportation business, so it has to be something that, that lets people move from point A to point B. So we were allowed to build a trail to Grove Ave, but not north of Grove Ave. This grant came along, it's the first time this grant's been offered in three years. This grant came along, and this grant's in the business of recreation. So they're fine with the dead end trail. Um, 
because it you know has the great views. So it's a nice opportunity. The other thing the reason it's a great opportunity is if you remember City Council approved a CPA authorization of about one hundred and four thousand dollars to rehab the Beaverbrook Bridge. Mm -hmm. So we have the money to go ahead with Beaverbrook Bridge without doing this this grant. But what's wonderful is this grant has a local match. So that we're asking for two hundred fifty thousand dollars of federal money. We have to provide two hundred fifty thousand dollars of local money. We're already one hundred and four thousand dollars there. Um, so that's where does the other money come from? Um, so we would be doing fundraising, of which we've already done about fifty thousand uh, dollars. We'd be going to CPA for doing it. So we have a lot of the money in hand for doing it. So we basically have one hundred fifty thousand towards two hundred fifty thousand. Um, and the rest will be some combination of CPA, not that they have any obligation to give it to us, and fundraising. Uh, Wayne, the, the clerk points out um, possibly a procedural problem in that the fact that they we're asking for approval to <coughs> borrow and this has not been vetted in finance. Um, and and is, is, is there any wrinkle here in the... Uh, in procedural process, because if if this hasn't gone through finance and been discussed and approved from finance, we, it may be inappropriate for us to be addressing here and now. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know your rules well enough. I have to refer to you. I mean, okay. if there's a way to waive it, I'd love you to because time is okay. pressure for us. But did you say finance was a sponsor? Of this? No, I put that in a lot usually because it usually goes it to finance first. So it's the standard language I put in, assuming that finance is going to vote for it the same night. Will we be borrowing $500,000? Yeah. So we do this about once a year um, when we apply for grants, but we are asking you to give us legal borrowing authority. You need the, that in order to get the, get the grant. Right. The issue is the state's been burnt by a lot of people who, towns who applied for money and then weren't ready to go. So if you remember, every single year we ask you for authority. We've done it for Florence Fields. We did it for the Boathouse site. We've, we've done it for other projects. And then every year Susan comes before you at some point in the year and, and has you revoke it. So this is one of the ones we'd like the borrowing authority to apply for the grant. If we get the grant, we're not going to borrow and we'd revoke and you, it. And you need that in order to apply for the grant. So we can't cut out that. that right. Paragraph. I do need that. Yeah. Um, well, that that's relevant to some degree, but actually procedurally it, it, it is incorrect. I mean, we, um, and I don't know, honestly, I don't know based on charter and I'd have to defer to somebody else if we even have the uh, right to waive a, um, a finance committee review and referral. Um, yeah. We have a finding. We do have a finance committee meeting coming up, but that means this won't be on the agenda until the first meeting in May. But which was when the second reading for this would be scheduled. So if it if it survives uh, finance with a recommendation with a positive recommendation, then we can do two readings. Uh, yeah. Mr. President, um, I'd like to recommend we table this for till later in the meeting to give us uh, me a chance to check out the chart. Check out the charter. Yeah. Um, I'm amenable to that. Uh, is everyone okay with that? Yes. We just table this for later in the meeting. Allow for uh, uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels to do the charter review. I would trust him with that. Thank you so we can, much. We can bring this back up at 1130. <laughs> <laughs> After we suspend rules, of course. <laughs> Nay. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on to the next item then, uh, which is the authorization of farm licenses on conservation land. This is a second reading. Correct. Right. This is, this is as amended. So everyone recognizes that. So this is the uh, as amended. Second. There's a second. Any discussion on this? Thank you. Uh, okay, then let's have a roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Aye. Yes. Murphy? Yes. Yes. Next up is uh, second reading for the authorization to sell one for Pine Street or Florence Grammar School. As it's Move. More Move. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this? Mm -hmm. just, uh, just for a point of information, I spoke with uh, the procurement officer today and he says he has six uh, bid packages out. 
Well, it doesn't mean we'll get six back, but six people have taken the packages, so there seems That's to good. be uh, interest in the building. And did everyone receive the memo that was uh, based on the question that was advanced to the mayor? Uh, yeah, I just want to thank the mayor and, and, and um, the procurement officer for following up on that. Uh, any other discussion? The roll call. Oh, I just want to say that uh, I think everybody who got a package has called me about the uh, the building. So anyway, there is interest in it, and I'm ecstatic. Great, that's excellent. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Bright. Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Hi. Councilor Yes. 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 Property is now surplused. This upon the uh, this, this upon the recommendation of the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission, and this is uh, second reading as well. This is accept the state hospital conservation restriction. I'll accept. Approved. Second. second. Discussion on this. Roll call, please. Councilor Freeman. Aye. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. 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 This is in first reading. This is oh, this is on what was the amendment? But the, this is this document's been amended uh, since the referral, um, but you have the amended language in your hands or in your packets. On this, upon the recommendation of the Committee on Cultural and Recreation Services, uh, this is <coughs> an ordinance of the City of Northampton providing that the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton to be amended by revising Section 22.3 of said code, providing that Committee on Cultural and Recreation Services. Uh, and be it ordained by the City Council, the City of Northampton, in City Council assembled as follows. That Section 22-3 of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended. So that the section shall read as follows. Delete in its entirety, 22-3, Committee on Cultural and Recreation Services, add in place thereof, 22-3, Committee on Cultural and Recreation Services, A, Duties and Responsibilities, the Committee on Cultural and Recreation Services shall address the and develop policy for cultural and recreational services offered and facilitated by the city. The committee shall promote city policies that enhance cooperation and coordination between the city services and private and government funded agencies, organizations, and enterprises. Two, relative only to cultural and recreation services, the committee may require a member of an appointed multi-member body that uh, should be a scrivener's error, because it's I'm pretty sure it's not multi-member, Bodie, uh, B-O-D-Y or a city employee to appear before it to give any information that the committee may require in relation to the municipal services, functions, powers, or duties which are within the scope of responsibility of that person and not within the jurisdiction of the school committee. The committee shall give a minimum of seven days notice to a person who is required to appear before it under this section. The notice shall include specific questions on which the committee seeks information and no person call to appear before the committee under this section shall be required to respond to any question not relevant or related to those questions presented in advance in writing. And the city agencies may include but are not limited to the Arts Council, the Northampton Center for the Arts, Forbes Library, Lilly Library, any public art committee, the Recreation Commission, the Recreation Department, and the Department of Public Works Parks Division. The committee will notify the mayor of any information requests under this section. And three, the committee may also request information from non-public or non-municipal cultural or recreational organizations or boards. And four, the committee may establish liaisons with those involved in programming pertaining to the arts sponsored by the Northampton School Department or School Committee. B, membership. Membership shall consist of three city councilors. C, meetings. The committee will be, as required by the city council, the committee's chair, or at request of two of its members. Accept the motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. Uh, this as as amended and and the scrivener's error adjusted. Um, 
Any discussion on this, uh, Councilor Adams? Um, I think this is a this is a good potential template for future council committees. Uh, I know C Councilor Freeman Daniels, the chair of the committee that that sponsored it, um, went out of his way to use express charter language, um, which which takes advantage of one of our powers in the charter, the power to investigate. And um, and I think that this again could be useful as a as a potential template for future committees as we um, review our committees and possibly make <coughs> some amendments to them. Thank you. Any other comments? Dr. Freeman Daniels is busy, very hard at work here. Scouring. Uh, I'll just I echo. Uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 so, yeah, uh, go ahead. I echo uh, Councillor Adams' um, comments here. Um, the uh, I, I think that um, ultimately I'll just say again, like I say every time. Uh, ultimately, I believe the council committee should be in the council rules and orders. Uh, and this was actually a discussion that the solicitor and I had um, prior to this. And what le uh, part of it is what um, the discussions that the solicitor and I had led to my amending uh, the the uh, the language slightly in this. But uh, so so. Ultimately, um, I do believe we should move the council committees into the council rules and orders, uh, and um, this one probably will be one of the first ones because it, we've done a pretty significant rewrite of it. Um, some of the earlier language was consolidated, and some of the actual committee functioning was ho really wholly amended so that it's more consistent with the charter. And uh, I think I was I, I think I, I I hope the council passes this and uh, and that, that it does become something to refer to in the future any other discussion um, roll call please yes 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 hi next up for first reading is uh, an ordinance uh, parking for at all times on Hockenham Road and the Fair Street extension. This is the first reading. Uh, accept the motion. Move to approve. Second it. Second. Any discussion on this? Councilor Murphy? Uh, just from, from ordinance. Can uh, we recognize? Yes, but this is the one to stop people from parking under the water systems that the farmers use. People go hike down there and they park underneath the water apparatus the farmers use to fill up their vehicles and this just tank there. Uh, yeah, and this just means you can't park underneath there. It's one parking space on the way to that house. Any other discussion on that? Um, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Hi. Yes. Uh, this is second reading, uh, parking prohibited at all times on Barrett Place. Um, I'll accept a motion. Move to approve. Approve. Second. Any further discussion on this? <coughs> Roll call, please, Mary. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Hi. Councilor Yes. Yes. Um, we are... We're going to make it before the rules expire. I believe these are for referral. This is <clears throat> upon the recommendation of the Planning Board an ordinance uh, to amend 350A and 350B table of uses and table of uh, dimensions for URA to be referred to the Planning Board, uh, Ed Lou, and uh, ordinance. Actually, um, take them as a group. Can, can we take these? They're all 350 changes 10, 11, 12, and 13. Can we refer them all as a group? Um, uh, I'd council, as a moved as a group. Second. Second as a group. Okay. Any discussion to refer? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Bada boom. Ooh. All right. Um, in my haste to uh, get the meeting going, I managed to overlook the uh, one minute announcement, so we'll slot that in here. To allow councilors to make any announcements that they feel. And I know Council Murphy has something he wants to, to comment on. Yeah, um, I would like 
to remind everybody that at our next finance meeting Tuesday, 5 o'clock, this building, we're having the city auditor, the, the report on the outside audit of the city from Mr. Scanlon. Uh, and, okay. and that it can be a very meaningful event for everybody. It, I don't think it's going to result in a presentation to council. So if you want to go over the audit report, it would be good to be at finance if you can be or uh, pick up a copy of the audit but that's the real back and forth time with the auditor would be at that committee meeting so i'd encourage any counselor that can come it, it is a, an important meeting and also member of the public and members of the public because it is open to the public so it will be next tuesday at five o'clock in this room and, and I, I, I concur that i agree that, that the public should show keen interest particularly in the context of the discussion of the override vote in order to get a sense of how well the city was managed, or not how well, depending on it. But I'm optimistic that we're going to have a pretty pretty good review on it going to be represented, but the community get an opportunity to understand how, how this city is managed fiscally. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Uh, at uh, 7 o'clock, April 24th, uh, the, uh, the uh, council chambers, I believe, there will be a meeting a 25% design meeting for the Pleasant Street, Con Street roundabout pro proposal. That's the uh, roundabout proposed at the bowling at the bowling alley, at gas station, uh, car, you know, bank lot, and so on. Um, that's uh, it's in the state layout. In the states, it's a state's project, and uh, this is one of their uh, public fora. It's a it's a hearing actually, a 25% hearing, a completion hearing, and um, I encourage anyone who uh, has an interest in that section of the city and is interested in that uh, gateway to uh, attend the meeting. It looks as though the design plan is for a single lane roundabout. Yes. Any other one minute announcements? Uh, no new business, I'm assuming. Okay. Oh, looks. Hey, do you have a poll? I'm sorry? Do we have a poll petition? We have a public Yeah, you got a public now. Oh, my God. I, mean, I was staring right at it. I'm sorry. This is my job. Yes, thank you very much for doing my job. Uh, there will be a public hearing May 2nd at the next council meeting, 2013, at 7.05 p.m. for petition for poll and wire locations, National Grid, number 140, 128, 16 Meadow Street, Northampton. Can I do another one-minute announcement? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the uh, Northampton, the Friends of Northampton Trails and Greenways will be organizing a rail trail cleanup day April 28th, 9 o'clock to 11. Um, that's, a, that's Saturday. Um, they're going to do the downtown section, King to Pleasant Street. There's a lot of trash on the on and off the, the bike trail, so they'll be cleaning up that if you want to join in 9 to 11. Also, can we pick up the, that item from the table that we put down oh thank you good lord yes i'm sorry yes yeah, so we had an item uh, pending on the table poor wayne probably was apoplectic here thought we were going to adjourn and not even discuss it i'm sorry what was your finding uh mr president i can find no reference in the charter that requires a uh, referral regarding uh, borrowing authority to uh, to the finance committee is it uh, so? Is it, it could be elsewhere, though, right? It could be an ordinance. Could it be Mass General Law? Could be. Um, I, I, I would like to say that I, I would recommend that we actually um, refer this back through finance. Yeah. We'll have the finance committee. Um, in two, we can do it, and then we can do it in two readings on May 2nd, should it survive. Move to refer finance. to finance. Much better about that. Okay, so the motion is to refer um, to finance. Second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so it's been referred to finance, and Wayne will, um, and you may want to come to that. Yeah, that might expedite that. Yeah, we're going to see meet the auditor, too, so. Perfect. You got a lot of sign in. Uh, accept the motion to adjourn before we adjourn. Okay, all those Second. in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We have another. <laughs>